transmitting from Sector 14845. By the authority of the Guardians of the Universe, Blog of Oa Lanterns, Myron Rumsey, and Bill Giant Coley, proclaim the podcast of Oa. You have been chosen to receive this transmission because you are without fear. Without fear. The podcast of Oa. Welcome back to the podcast of Oa. This is episode 200. 200 since 2011. I'm Bill Giant Coley. I'm back for a special episode, and I'm here with Phil Bova and Myron Rumsey. Both are the guardians of the podcast, Boa, and it's so great to be back, gentlemen. Thanks, Phil. Uh, it's, it's great to have you back to join us, and thank you for doing the intro. This is very old school. We're going to use the old school intro as well. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm pumped for this, and, and I apologize to folks for taking a little while. Uh, we had to kind of get all three of our schedules in line, and we were all set to go, and I had a major malfunction with my birth defect, and I had no voice, I had no energy, I, I had to cancel out, so we, we had to kind of reschedule. So it took us a little longer to get this, this together, but I'm very excited for this, and I can't wait to share all of the great listener feedback we got. What about you, Phil? Well, I do want to add that one cancellation was largely due in part to my own fault, because uh, we had our, me and my wife had our anniversary, and uh, I definitely love the show, but I don't think it would have gone over well recording on the night of, of the anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Did you say I have lantern business? And you're well, like, yeah. she, she did. She did say, I don't mind, blah, 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 this and that. I was like, no, no, no. I insisted. I was like, my Renault will be fine with it. He's not going to get too upset. I go, and at least we don't have to, we can stave off talking about Simon. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how you turn a negative into a positive right exactly that's cool well, no it's that, was, that was probably a good move on your part it was it was and it, and it's good i'm i was looking forward to tonight and it's, it's good to talk to bill because i haven't i haven't talked to you in forever and uh it's, it is been a while i'm trying to think the last time i remember being on it was around 150 might have been might have been it's been a while been, yeah it has been absolutely no, I'm glad to be back. This is, um, uh, it's nice. And it's been, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, Myron, and it, yeah, it was um, June 2011, right? Yeah, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. Yeah, holy cow. Yeah, I was I was like, wow, that's, that's a, that's a hell of a, hell of a run, a decade, a little more than a decade. It was nine uh, and a half, e- of- but nine and a half years longer than I thought it was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, really. Uh, yeah, who knows? The first one. Yeah, I know. What did we start with? It was the Green Lantern movie. It was with Ryan Reynolds. And uh, yeah, I think we we went to the midnight showing, and then we uh, we I do I don't think we recorded right afterwards. We just did it the day after, right? Right, then right. All went to sleep or something. Yeah, yeah, because we went to like a midnight showing. Yeah, and that was um, yeah. No, I remember. Uh, I remember. At the midnight showing, you know, we're all, you know, I meet you there and um, I go to get the popcorn and the woman selling the popcorn, I say a woman, it's like a college kid, selling me the popcorn and she like is uh, like looking around. She's like, what is this all about? And and then she just kind of, and she's talking to her, the other person next to her. And she's like, what is this? What is this all about? Why is everybody in green? And <laughs> she's like, she goes, oh, man, it's just like it's another like superhero movie or something like some sarcastic moment. And she handed me the popcorn and I held up my hand and I had the Green Lantern ring on. And I was like, it's the Green Lantern. And I just took my popcorn. I was in such disgust. And I was like, you know what? Let's start a freaking podcast and go for a decade. Shove that in her face, wherever she is now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this was done out of spite and the Red Ring. Uh, before the Red Ring was the Red Ring. <laughs> That's right. Worth no- worth noting that that said college student is now probably a brain surgeon or something. <laughs> uh, actually, funny story. She is now um, the my boss, so it's been awkward. That's funny. Uh, it was um, it was just a that I just remember that was the night. I, I think we talked about it beforehand, but um, 
that was like when we were like, yeah, this is a great capper and we saw some highs and lows, you know? That's right. So before we kick into some reminiscing over the last 200 episodes, got a little bit of Green Lantern news. Not a lot. I'll try to get through it really quickly, but I want to share this information with our listeners. Uh, on the Funko line news, we've got two new Funko Green Lantern figures coming out. There's a White Lantern Wonder Woman, and then there's a Hal Jordan Funko soda figure, which these are little figures that come in soda cans. Uh, that you open up and then there's a figure in it. Different style than a regular Funko Pop, but those are both coming out soon. And then uh, XM Studios, which is uh, over in the Asian part of the of the world, they have a Kyle Rayner statue coming out. Looks gorgeous. The downside is, is that their U.S. distributor, GFX Distribution, does not sell those statues in that scale. So you can't buy it in the United States, which is just crazy to think of. Uh, you may be able to find it on the secondary market, but there's no distributor for the United States, which kind of stinks. Uh, well, other- it's also worth adding that even if you order it, <laughs> shipping it here is probably going to take a while because, you know, it's probably never going to get to the ports of L.A. <laughs> right. And, and the cost for shipping would be astronomical. In fact, yeah. I don't even know if they'll ship to the U.S., but uh, it's worth ch- if you're really, really interested in it, check it out. Uh, you can find an article on the blog of OA, and I think it's got a link to XM's uh, website where you can look. But uh, unfortunately, GFX responded to uh, fan inquiries and said, I'm sorry, we're not selling anything that's in that of uh, their products that are in this scale. So, kind of stinks. Uh, this weekend, and we're recording this on October 14th, this weekend is DC Fandom. The million dollar questions is, uh, are Green Lantern fans going to get skunked again? Because none of the producers or actors that have already been announced for the show are listed in the attendees at this point. In fact, here it is Thursday, and we don't really have a list of all the panels. Uh, There had been a leaked uh, story that there was supposed to be the announcement of the entire cast of the HBO Max series, but eh, not really thinking it's going to happen. And uh, tied to DC Fandom, DC is getting in on the NFT bandwagon, and you can get two DC NFTs just for signing up for the DC Fandom website. They send you one, and then if you share a post, they'll send you another one for free. Uh, I got uh, Val Zed and uh, Kal-El. I got Superman uh, for my two. But there are, I know there's a Jon Stewart one, there's a Hal one, and a Jessica one at least. I don't know about the other characters. Uh, And then the last bit of DC news, DC just announced a new six-issue event that's going to be the Justice League versus, versus the Legion of Superheroes. It's going to have a, a, a focus on the Gold Lanterns, and it's written by Brian Michael Bendis. So take that as well. So anyway, that's that's it for Green Lantern news. So let's let's jump into some reminiscences. And I kind of made a, a top list of my six favorite things from the show so far. So um, six, six. I I tried to narrow it down to six. It was difficult. Uh, but one of them has 15 things in it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's 16. It's number 5B. 5B, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't know, uh, gentlemen, have, have you guys thought about what, you, what your favorite memories of the show have been in your experiences? Um, oh, yeah. Would you, would, 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 would one of you like to go first? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think, yeah. I think I'll, uh, actually, it goes into what one of our listeners stated. <laughs> our favorite shows and it has to be your one <laughs> when you found out the animated series was canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, man, this is classic. There's sometimes when I go back and listen to it just to hear your disdain because it's like, that's an appreciative level of disdain that he has for that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was rough, you know, dealing with him. He was like <laughs> drinking heavily. Like, <laughs> well, more so than usual, I should say. And <laughs> it's oh, a, yeah, you were uh, you were on fire, Meyer. I it was rough, you know. Uh, I loved that show, uh, probably better than any Green Lantern outside of the comic books. Any any adaptation, uh, by far my favorite thing. And I was so in love with that show. And when they announced it wasn't going to be renewed for a second season. I was absolutely crushed, and we get, we we start recording, and Bill, you were you weren't raining me, and you were just like, "Let me go." <laughs> well, why? I mean, first of all, you don't step in front of a freight train, <laughs> and uh, no, it it you were. Let's put it this way: I think, as Phil said, it's a pretty you know you can appreciate the level of you know, um, well, pain you were feeling, 
and you you were bra- you wanted to slug anybody at Wa- Warner Brothers. Yeah, I was I was hot. I really was, and it it was not my proudest moment, uh, but it, it did make my top top six uh, moments from the show. It, it's funny we 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 were blessed to have Giancarlo Volpe on the show, who was one of the producers, and he was such a fantastic interview, such a great guy. It was funny when you do these interviews, you're like, okay, I, I'm asking someone to give me their time. And you're trying to be very cognizant of how much of their time you're using. And you don't want to overstate your welcome, right? So we're talking and he kept going and going. And I'm like, I'm thinking in the back of my head, I, you know, I, I don't want to cut him off. But at the same time, we've gone on longer than what he said he, yeah, we we could talk. <laughs> right, right. He's on you the West know. Coast, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> He's on the West Coast, you know, and uh, but he was such a gracious individual, and, and I've I've interacted with him on Twitter and Facebook a number of times uh, since then, and uh, he he emailed me or texted me or tweeted me, I can't remember which, after that episode came out, and he actually ca- counted the number of curse words and had them like the number of times I said uh, the f word, and he had a tally, like he had tally marks. It was hysterical. Uh, <laughs> and, and looking back on it, I think when we interviewed him, he knew then he was already aware, but he couldn't say anything. Uh, but yeah. No, you, well, but he was very good with the information as far as, I mean, there was, you know, a lot of discussions about where financially it was, you know, that, you know, some of the decisions were strictly financial. You yeah. Know? It certainly uh, wasn't the ratings. You know, he said the ratings were great. No, I, 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 but you know, how many, you know, with the market the way it is and how many shows there are and 15 million different types of ways you can see it, um, it is pretty amazing. Um, you know, I'm glad we got two years and like a, a like a full, you know, uh, story out of it. Uh, when you see some good shows go three or four, but I think he was, what I liked about that interview mostly was Giancarlo just being very um, – he didn't get, like, secretive or, like, he couldn't – he just – he told it like it was, and it, you know, and it, and it sucked. But, you know, good – you know, I think that was, like, a really good interview. Got a lot of good information for their fans and everything. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It, it, it led to something really interesting. After we interviewed both Giancarlo Volpe and Jim Krieg, Jim Krieg had moved on and was doing another show, and I just can't now remember the name of it, but it was like a kid's horror show, you know, like an R.L. Stein type of thing. And he was doing these uh, podcasts where he and the cast would watch the episode and make a commentary track. And he ran into an issue where the person that was recording the episodes couldn't do it. And he actually emailed me and said, hey, you know, would you help us out? Would you record an episode of this for us and give us the audio back? And so I did it. And I just thought it was so cool that he thought of thought of me to do that for him, which which, which, which was really cool. Uh, but, yeah, the my meltdown was not a pretty sight, but it is one of the most memorable moments of the show, I think. <laughs> I'm still great going about it. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just got to have those moments, man. It just, it happens. And, and, and we've always tried to keep this show family friendly. And that was one where we didn't bleep anything out. Uh, and I, I think Bill, you just hit record and stood back and we'll let it go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, it, it's better to hear it all out, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, it's for, it's for the record. That will be like, you know, later on down the line when you're, you know, getting arrested for something at Warner brothers. <laughs> uh, uh, Bill, what about you? Do you have something you want to share? A memory? Oh yeah, there. I mean, there's a lot of memories uh, there. Um, I think you know it's funny. I, I'm kind of grouping this my this memory into a whole bunch of little memories of just some of the the first time we started getting ah. like fan mail, um, and you know people like who are listening and seeing that that memory of just like, wow, you know, not only, you know, cause we're, we're, we're a very niche podcast. So just to be able to, t- when we're talking about the green lantern and seeing the fans out there and how much they really love the character and how they were following around. And some people would argue with us or some people would, you know, and, and just seeing like that kind of connection and interaction that was, you know, Bill, um, as an overall memory, um, from getting, Seafoam lantern T-shirts, 
for to you and I creating the Seafoam Lantern uh, lore and that photo. I think um, we took a basically a day off of work. I mean, we went to work, but we were that was what we were doing all day at work. <laughs> <laughs> Photoshopping that photo, but <laughs> and I think we had a friend of ours take that picture, and they had no idea what was going on. <laughs> so they were just like, "What is going on?" And we're wearing these sea foam shirts, and we're like, "Oh, you gotta check out this picture." It, it, um, it was it was great to hear from people, you know, especially when we started getting emails from people from other countries, because you, you know we started this. Oh, yeah. I, I'm thinking, you know, nobody's gonna listen to this. We're a niche within a niche within a niche. And we started getting emails from Ireland and other countries. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, people are actually listening to this. Well, right. And that's what I mean, like, because, you know, we knew we were getting listeners. You could tell if people were you know, tuning in. But when they started interacting, it was like, oh, my Lord. You know, and it was kind of we even met a couple. Um, where were we? We went to some convention and a person showed up there. Yeah, I don't remember. A librarian from Binghamton. Oh, oh, yeah. It was at River Road Expo at the uh, casino. Yeah, and she knitted us a bunch of um, all the emblems for the Christmas tree. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That was cool. Yeah. And, and yeah. The, the whole Seafoam Lantern thing, you and I were just kind of riffing on all of the emotional spectrum. And we started making up these other cores. And the, the Seafoam thing took off. And then we had a, a listener who took that, who did the artwork and created a little Brian mini Dupont. comic. Brian, yes, Brian Dupont. He, he created the logo and, and all this stuff. And we made up a little oath. And he sent us a package in the mail. It was, it was the only time we've, I think we've ever gotten a package in the mail from a listener. And it was it was exciting because we we're like, what is it? What is it? And we opened up in his, his you know, T-shirts. And it was it was so cool. And it, and it became a thing where it was an ongoing thing in the show for, for a number of episodes to talk about the Seafoam Lanterns. It was hysterical. No, it was. And I, I think that's, and again, that's, that's the memory I, I took out of it was like, oh, wow, you know, you really don't realize when you're going into this that people are going to want to communicate with you. And from all over, as you mentioned, and around the world, that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Speaking of that, my power ring is blinking right now, which tells me that we have some incoming listener feedback. So power ring, why don't you go ahead and play the first message we've got for this episode? Our first message is an audio transmission from the Emerald Enthusiast. Transmitting audio in three, two, one. Hey, what's up, Blog of Oa? It's your boy, the Emerald Enthusiast, and I wanted to congratulate you on 200 episodes. It's a really impressive, gentlemen. I'd like to thank you for sharing your lives with all of us, whether it's been Myron discussing how Hal Jordan has helped him recover from physical struggles or Phil being a new dad, talking about his experiences with Clark. It's all been really heartwarming, and as a Green Lantern fan, I never get enough of hearing the comics dissected and analyzed, and of course, thank you for having me on the show last year and tolerating me when I was so nervous. I wish you continued health and continued success. Keep those rings charged, gentlemen, and keep lighting the way. Once again, man, we hear from Donnie, and I got to say, I, I, I like hearing from the guy. He's a... Uh, He's so enthusiastic about his uh, his his passion for Green Lantern, and you know it's it's fun getting feedback from him, and I like bouncing stuff off him on Twitter every once in a while because you know he shares a lot of things, and you know it's it's hard to get him down, and he even you know he's 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 very comical in the sense that he gets us when it comes to Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, hats off to you, Donnie. I'm I'm glad you're a listener and. You know, we'd love to have you on the show again sometime soon, and and I think that'd be a cool idea. And um, just so you know, Clark's doing great. I mean, this this kid's, you know, he's a champion, and uh, he's going to be two in January already. <laughs> Gosh. Um, so, uh, yeah, what do you got to say, Myron? Uh, I just, you know, I always appreciate anybody taking time out of their day to let us know. Uh, that they're listening, and I know Donnie listens, and we don't agree on everything. He he uh, he's pretty positive about anything Green Lantern related. I'm a little bit more selective in my taste, but yet we can be friends even though we don't agree. And and right. I think that's the important, important thing that we try to stress on the show is you may not agree with everything we have to say or what our opinions are, uh, but we're going to express them and we'll be as respectful as we can. And 
uh, we encourage you to do the same. So I, you know, and Donnie, I don't know whether what he's doing now on YouTube and so on. So if any of that spins out of his appearance on our show or not, you know, he talked about how nervous he was for that episode. And now you see him doing videos and he's hosting his own co-host and his own podcast. So I think that's just great. You know, that's legacy. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy. So uh, if I continue on with memories, you guys have named two of my top six. So I want to go to my lowest hanging one that you guys didn't mention yet. And that's uh, during the Grant Morrison run, there was a three month time frame where they did the Green Lantern Black Stars arc. And, um, and, and I'll go over a little bit of the, the, the story about it. So because I, I know, Bill, you probably weren't reading it then. But they did a whole thing where how changed reality got changed the villain of the story changed reality around us and so i came up with what i thought was a cute witty idea to do a meta thing and so as we were talking about the book and we got to that part of the story we did a whole little warp thing and i i had an alien voice doing the character's voice as reality was warping and then phil and i kept talking as though the book had changed and had become black stars and so that's what we did and for three months we had a completely different intro we rebranded the show as the podcast of asteroid x which was the home base for for hal during that that three months and tried to play it as though we were in that reality kind of a meta thing and i i don't know if it just fell flat or what but nobody picked up on it at all i was i was kind of disappointed i was like boy did we do a bad job at this or was it were we just being too hip for the room i don't know yeah, that was that you that was, you hit on one of mine. That's one of my my favorite parts. <clears throat> I enjoyed that. It it kind of threw us off a little bit because I remember a couple times that I almost slipped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, like, you broke uh, you broke the the fourth wall. <laughs> that's right, right. So, uh, but you no, know, that was really cool. That was one that was one of the fun times, man. You know that. Um, I like that arc anyway. That was a good arc. I know. You know, Bill. I don't know. I don't think Bill has ever read it, but that was actually one of the better parts of that series. I think. Yeah, and it was all designed to give Liam Sharp a few months to catch up because he was doing all of the artwork for the book, and so they switched artists and did this other arc in the middle of that run to give him a little bit of a breather in between to to kind of recharge his power battery, so to speak. But it was cool. And I think, you know, that inventiveness is something that we've always tried to do, whether it was back in the beginning, Bill, when you you did the Kilowog Challenge and those kind of things. To me, that's always been one of the fun things. The Kilowog Challenge. The Kilowog Challenge. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's right, you poozer. I've been wanting to say poozer for a long, a long time. Um, <laughs> I've used that a long time. Poozer. So uh, why don't when you guys uh, throw out with something that we haven't talked about yet? I uh, I think one of I think well you know I had a that was a really cool episode that I was on with you guys long 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 time ago back you know well before I became co-host of it. But I think one that I I liked when we were doing our episodes uh, weekly during the pandemic. You know I I thought it filled our time really well and broke up <laughs> kind of like the disparity of what was going on around us. <laughs> yeah. And, and that actually was my number one fondest memory of this show so far was during the height of the pandemic when everybody was quarantining and nobody was going anywhere. What we did, Bill, was we recorded weekly and we turned the mic around and we interviewed fans. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, it's really fun. It, it is always interesting to, uh, again, there's that connection um, worldwide through this medium. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was cool. We 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 called we called it "You Are the Core," and we interviewed like we interviewed Mark Mark Marble and Chad Bolkeman from the Lantern Cast. Uh, we interviewed Donnie. We 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 interviewed a number of fans from all walks of life, uh, a very diverse group uh, from all over the world. We had uh, one person I think is in Australia or New Zealand. I can't remember which. Do you remember Bill or Phil? Uh, I want to say it was New Zealand. Yeah, I, I don't remember, um, but but she was an interesting interview, and uh, we basically had some stock questions, and it was basically you know what's your what's your favorite story, what's your favorite character. We had kind of a stock set of questions, but every episode we turned, like I said, we turned the microphone around and spotlighted our fan, our fellow fans, which for me was really cool. I mean, we've we've had a lot of interviews, but it was fun to interview 
other Green Lantern fans just like us. No, I can imagine. You know, um, and again, that New Zealand, God, you know, think about it. That's clear across the world. Yeah, that's yeah. It, it was oh, Australia. I'm sorry, it was Australia. Was, was it Australia? I, I couldn't remember. I know, I know, it was in that section. Uh, it, but it was, it was, it was interesting because what we were trying to do was the world was in these uncertain times, and we were trying to just lend a regularly recurring, reassuring, familiar voice for Green Lantern fans. And so we upped our game and we did it weekly, which you know was was a lot of extra work on our parts, but I thoroughly enjoyed it and it was worth every minute. Oh, that's awesome. I'm sure a lot of people appreciated that as well. So we have some more listener feedback. We've, we've gotten a number of messages from folks and this next message is uh, something pretty cool. So uh, why don't we pause for a second and let the power ring play the next message we've got. The next celebration comes from Daniel, who runs the book club of OA. Transmitting in three, two, one. I just wanted to say thank you for creating this space for us GL fans and for being such great ambassadors for this fandom. You and Phil truly bring a smile to my face every time a new episode of the podcast drops. You are a bright light of enjoyment and entertainment in some difficult times. You have also created the means for me to connect with new people by letting me run with the GL Book Club. The Book Club is a source of great fun and enjoyment for me that I consistently look forward to. I have been able to meet some great fellow GL fans who I now call friends. I wanted to personally thank Stuart, Lincoln, and Chris for being regular members of the Book Club and for joining me on so many amazing chats. You guys make my week. But thank you Myron and Phil for creating a fun and positive podcast for us Ring Slingers. We really appreciate it. And congratulations on 200 episodes. Here's to 200 more. In brightest day. Hey, Daniels, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day and sharing that with us. And thank you so much for doing the book club. Uh, if, if you guys that are listening to the show uh, aren't aware about the Green Lantern Book Club, I try to pump it up whenever we, we have anything coming out about it. But Daniel runs through the Blog of OA Facebook group, a Green Lantern Book Club. And he gets together on Skype with other fans and they talk about different books. And in fact... Next week, August 20th at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, they're going to be talking about the second part or another part of Tom King's Omega Men, talking about issues four, issues 4 through 6. And if you want to get in on the action, you can shoot an email to the book club of OA. The email address is bookclubofoa at gmail.com. Or join the Blog of OA Facebook group, and you can see it. It's one of the announcements we have at the top of the page. But it's a lot of fun. It gives you a chance to chat with other, other fans about books that you love. It's kind of a virtual sit around the comic book shop and talk about comics. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. He always asks how I'm doing and stuff. Uh, he'll send me a message and ask how things are going and stuff. And I, and I still feel genuinely bad that I haven't been on that book club yet. I was going to jump in, and it was right about the time we were having some controversy, and I didn't want to take away from... Um, what he was talking about. So I feel bad because it was he was talking about stuff I really wanted to, wanted to be a part of it, and I, I wasn't able to. But uh, and and he's built his own little community within a community, which is great. Uh, so you know I I I can't uh, be positive more th- about it than I am. I think it's a great it's a great offshoot of what we've been doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just a great person. I'm like, how many people does he have on that group? Do you know by chance? I I'm not sure how many how many he's been getting, but uh, you know it, it can always use one more. So, yep. <laughs> true. The more lantern fans, the better. Just way to you know inspire more you know resource you know more groups. Yeah, yeah, and and really you know the whole point of the show and the blog was to to create this ambassadorial promotion of the franchise and it's really cool to see somebody take that and put their own spin on it and, and continue it and, and, and grow it in another direction so that's very cool uh on to other memories i've got to share one of my favorite moments of the show this is in my top three uh there was a time bill when we were trying to find a creative way to talk about our other members of the green lane accord and what you know, what phil's been doing now is a, a whole section called know your core and back in the day what we did was 
you had me write up details about a character and that gave you a creative output to write a mock interview. And then we'd have your brother who did uh, would do different voiceovers <laughs> for us. He's an actor and he would do different voices and we would do this mock interview over Skype. Like we were Skyping into OA and Green Lantern headquarters and interview different members of the Green Lantern Corps, which was a huge amount of fun. And I still use some of those sound bits of, of Salak and, and Guy Gardner that you created some of those bumpers. I, I still use them today, but there was a time when, Bill, you really did not like Guy Gardner. And we decided to have an interview where we were going to call in to Oa and Guy Gardner was going to answer instead of the person we were supposed to interview. And he was going to take the crap out of us for, for, for belittling him over the show over previous episodes, which was so hilarious and so funny because it added in the big brother, little brother dynamic that you and your brother have on top of it all. And it was, it was, it was so cool to have him as Guy Gardner kind of cut us both, both the ribbons. Yeah, that's still that's still a big problem uh, during Thanksgiving when my brother does the Guy Garner voice at the table. To <laughs> Excuse me, my dog is like freaking out about something right now. I thought maybe that was Nort. <laughs> But yeah, those interviews were really, really a lot of fun. It was a lot of work on your part, Bill, but it was a lot of fun. And that whole conversation with Guy Gardner was was pretty darn funny. Uh, I, I loved yeah. it. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I just loved it. I, I just I loved how you you took the factual stuff that could have been kind of dry and turned it into something that was living and organic. And it was just it was I don't know. I thought it was cool. I thought it was one of the most creative things we've ever done. Well, I, I just my brother really ran with it. Um, you know, which I thought was, you know, funny. Um, and I just remember he, he really did a good job at, like, really bringing the character to life. And I think he just wanted to take shots at his little brother, too, as he put it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Phil, do you have a, a memory that you'd like to share? Um, you know, I really liked when Miss Darlene was on our show. Um and for more reasons than just like just the, the casual fan, I mean, she has this like just this just burning passion for her characterizations. And, and if anybody's ever you know, followed her on Instagram or, or know who she is, know, knows who she is, uh, she, she goes by Miss Darlene and she does a lot of cosplay. And uh, I mean, she's done like Saronic Natu. Um, She's done some really, really fantastic looks. Jessica, uh, Jessica Cruz was a, was a great one, and uh, she just puts a lot of work and effort into creating these characters and bringing them to life. And she goes to all these events, um, and she frequents a lot of these these cosplay shows and stuff. And she's just so much fun. And when she was on, she was just a delight to talk to because she's just a friendly, outgoing passionate person that really really genuinely loves the medium and um <clears throat> you know and it's, she's you know across the world halfway across the world you know and and having her on our show that time uh that was that was monumental um and i really really enjoyed it and you know it's funny because i've i've gotten such a good friendship with her or since that time and you know we sometimes go back and forth on instagram a lot and uh ask how each other's doing she loves clark and you know, I send her photos that I don't usually post and other stuff. And, you know, she sends me stuff that she's doing. And, um, you know, I just want to say that's that's probably in my top ones. And, and you know, and I just want to give her a huge shout out. And I hope she's doing well. Yeah, it's, it's neat to get those personal connections with people. And sometimes they click. And Darlene was really a, a neat interview. And it was... To me, it was refreshing because we didn't have any, we've never had a female voice on the show other than, yeah. uh, you know, the Aya voice and things like that, or the things we've had in some of the music and the intros and so on. And uh, so it was it was cool for that, but to talk about the cosplay and the power of cosplay, which to me is somewhat of an alien thing because I, I don't get into cosplay, but to hear her story and talk about how cosplay is so significant for her was really interesting for me. And she's really tasteful with, with her costumes. And... You know what she she did she did stress the importance of you know it being kid friendly too because 
she didn't want to do anything that was over exaggerant or over sexualized in any kind of fashion whatsoever. You know, so she she keeps it on, on a really, really clean level. Because even I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, you know, Blees would be a really, really cool costume. And uh, she had said, you know, I had thought about that at one time, but it's but it's really, really kind of revealing. And she's not that kind of person. So, um, yeah, it's, she, she's just great. I can't speak more highly of her. I just I told her one day that uh, Clark and Denise were going to all come down to Australia and hang out and just drink all night. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I hope to one day fulfill that passion. That'd be kind of cool. That would be cool. Bill, do you have anything you want to share? Um, I'm just, so going back in the memories, going, oh, wow. It seems, I remember, uh, what was it, where, G, where I was thinking about this, when Kyle becomes the White Lantern. And I remember when you and I were sitting there, and I that was kind of a low time for you, but that was at the height of where there was, what, six titles for the Green Lantern? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, so we were at the, the pinnacle of, like, where Green Lantern, you know, we were like, oh, my God, there's now, you know. And I remember Kyle, and I remember you seeing the one uh, – scene where Kyle is as uh looks as close to Jesus as you possibly could get. And I remember your reaction because you've never been a huge fan of Kyle. Correct? I'm I'm being yeah. fair in that. Oh right? yeah you're fair. You're fair with that. And when you saw him as Jesus, your reaction was wonderful. <laughs> Space Jesus. Yeah you were like Space <laughs> Jesus. This is exactly what we need. <laughs> <You're just> like, <laughs> Where's Hal? Because it was at the time, I think, where Hal, was he on the run at that point? It, it, uh, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't remember exactly how that lined up. Um, but yeah, Space Jesus was was interesting. But yeah, it was when he was in the New Guardians book. And I was really kind of frustrated with the fact that they took Carol Ferris out of the book because it was during the Venditti run. And he didn't want to really deal with Carol. So uh, Carol got picked up by the you New Guardians book. You were a lover scorn. <laughs> You were like, how could, what does she even see in Kyle? <laughs> Carl uh, Harris was like, yeah. It was like, your cop broke the bro code, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was Space Jesus. That was, that was funny. That was funny. So uh, we've got some more listener feedback, though. So Power Ring, uh, I, it's been blinking and it's driving me nuts. So Power Ring, why don't you go ahead and play the next message? We have another celebration. This one is from Eric. Or Celtic 527. Transmitting in 3, 2, 1. Hey guys, it's Eric or Celtic 527 here, and I just have to start off by giving a big congratulations to Myron, Bill, and Phil on 200 episodes of the podcast of OA. It's truly quite an achievement, so you all should be proud. I've been a listener since the very first episode, I believe, going back to 2011, and I haven't missed one since. Your guys' discussions and commentary on the Green Lantern franchise truly enhances my experience as a fan, so I really want to thank you all for that, especially Myron for all the hard work he puts into the show. I have to say my favorite some of my episodes were your reviews on Green Lantern the animated series and I absolutely love the conversation you guys had with the producers Giancarlo Volpe and Jim Krieg on what would have been if there was a season 2. Sigh. Anyway, I really hope the show continues for years to come, even though we're probably in the lowest point of Green Lantern's comics since the show began. I have to say I really enjoyed the recent episodes where you guys talked about the beginning of the Jeff Johns run and I was thinking you guys should continue on and talk about the next story arc, possibly all the way through Blackest Night. Not sure if you guys are interested in doing that but I certainly think it would be better than discussing the lackluster Green Lantern series we have now. I can't wait for you guys to talk about the next issue of Justice League Last Ride because that's honestly the only DC book I care to read right now. I'm sad it's ending but here's hoping we can get another Green Lantern series to read soon. Keep up the great work and congrats again. Well, thank you, Eric, uh, or as he calls himself, Celtic527. He's been with us for a decade. A decade. 2011, he's been here since the first episode. Thank you very much. That's, That's dedication. Yes, definitely. Uh, that, I mean, that's more dedication than I had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's going all the way back to Blackest Night. 
Ah, that's it. Well, thank you so very much. This is, this is part of what I'm talking about. Is like, wow, this is somebody who I would love to buy a beer. Absolutely. You know, it's it's, it's amazing to think that somebody would stick with us that long because. I, again, I've never thought anybody would care and let alone stick around for more than an episode or two. So I'm always impressed when somebody says, yeah, I've listened to all the episodes. And I'm like, really? Because I haven't, other than I'm recording them, you know? I, I don't like to listen to myself talk, so I don't I don't ever play them back once they're once they're edited and out there in the wild. I, I don't look back at them again. Uh, I, 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 too, loved the interview with Giancarlo Volpe and Jim Krieg when we started. I think we used the, the I'm in charge of the multiverse and there's an Earth Myron where I'm in charge and the two of you guys are locked in the basement somewhere and I'm making you write season two. What was it about? Kind of thing. And uh, I, I loved that part. And they really revealed some good stuff. You know, we were going to see eventually Kyle and, and John was going to be there and they were building towards Blackest Night and all that kind of stuff. Um that was really cool. It was a great opportunity again to, to really kind of find out things that maybe weren't going to be revealed in any other manner. So that was cool. Uh, and, and regarding your comments about doing the Jeff Johns run, I do think Phil, you and I need to get back to that because looking back at the show, we started in 2011. So we never talked about Sinestro Corps war or blackest night because that was in 2009. So those things all transpired before the show even started. And so we, we probably should, uh, other than when we talked about blackest night there a couple of years ago for its anniversary, uh, I think we, we, we owe it to ourselves and our listeners to go back and revisit the rest of that, that run. I agree. I need to revisit Sinestro Core War anyway. I haven't read that in quite some time, and I'd really like to delve back into it again. Yeah, agreed. God knows I'm not reading anything new, but other than a couple right. of books here or there. So, you know, we need, we, need, <laughs> we need to keep it positive. So, you know, that's one good way to do that. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite memories. It's really not one memory. It's really 15 rolled into one. Uh, we've, we've been blessed with a number of and a very diverse number of interviews. Besides interviewing our fellow fans, we have had 15 creator interviews on this show. You know, we had Giancarlo Volpe, we had Giancarlo and Jim Krieg together. Uh, Bill, you and I did Aaron Cooter's very first interview. Uh, that was cool. Uh, you and I, uh, it wasn't, I don't know if we did it as a podcast episode as well, but we did know we did it as a YouTube video. You and I ran a panel. It was like right before he really took off. Oh, right, yeah, right before Aaron Kuda broke up, broke, broke big. Uh, he was doing the New Guardians book, and he wrote, uh, he did uh, Rise of the Third Army. In fact, I have here hanging in the Lantern Cave a Rise of the Third Army poster that he did a Larfley sketch on for me. Uh, that was his very first professional interview which was really cool to, to be able to do that. And then you and I interviewed Ethan Van Skyver at another convention and did that as a video thing on the 10-year anniversary of Green Lantern Rebirth. Robert Venditti is quite the trooper. He was on this show five times during his time on the book. It's amazing. Uh, which was amazing. And what was funny is, is sometimes DC would contact me to do an interview like that, uh, but sometimes we would just chit-chat. Um, and he would then say, Hey, you know, when am I coming on the show again? We'll talk about this, the story. And then after we would get done, he would, uh, off mic, tell us a little bit of the behind the scenes stuff, which was always challenging because <laughs> it was stuff you wanted, you want to talk about what you really can't talk about, especially when you hear people criticize some of his run, because when you know the inside baseball stuff on some of it, it's like, man, I really want to defend him by telling this, but he's entrusted me not to say anything. Uh, and that's happened a few times. Uh, Ethan Van Skyver did the same thing. Ethan Van Skyver was messaging me on Facebook right before the rebirth movement. And he sent me the cover to Hal Jordan, the Greenland Accord number one, before the book was even announced. And he, he had told me at a convention that he and Venditti were going to do that book. And I was like, and I can't tell anybody. You know, that was the worst part. Uh, we had Van Jensen on twice who wrote Green Lantern Corps. Uh, we had Bill, Bill, David Gallagher. Do you remember the David Gallagher interview? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I went during the convergence months. And then we had uh, Mike Johnson who did the Green Lantern Star Trek crossovers. And then we were we were blessed with DC contacted us and wanted us to interview Dan Jurgens, which was – I was like, R really? You know, okay, yeah, sure, we'll interview Dan Jurgens if you if you really want us to, we'll do it for you, <laughs> you know. And then uh, then we had Liam Sharp on the did show. I miss, didn't I miss that Dan Jurgens one? No, you were you were on that one. That was one that you did. That was one I did. Okay, yeah, because because you were going on and on about how much you loved Cyborg, love Cyborg Superman. Of course. <laughs> 
and, and then we had <laughs> Liam Sharp, which was which was fantastic. Uh, but to to get over the course of two hundred episodes, fifteen interviews from comics professionals, I. I never would have expected we would have been able to do any of that stuff. Uh, I remember being so nervous when we interviewed Giancarlo Volpe because I'm like, I don't know, big name Hollywood producer, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you were like, Bill, fix your hair. And I'm like, it's not even in video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's really cool is all of them have been really humble, you know. I mean, they're just humble creators. I mean, especially Liam Sharp. He was just. I mean, that guy was just a, a laid back, <clears throat> I want to have a beer with you kind of guy, you know. And oh, yeah. Chat your ear off. And, you know, his stories about him and Grant Morrison are hilarious. You know, it's like them two in a room together. I'd love to sit down and just be a fly on that wall. <laughs> um, I, I, I got to talk about one interaction with one of those people. I'm not going to say who it was, um, but <laughs> one of them made an appearance at a comic book store uh, not too far away. And I showed up at the comic book store to get the person's book signed. And I'm wearing a Green Lantern hat, hat and a Green Lantern t-shirt. And he looks at me like, he, first of all, he doesn't recognize me, even though I introduced myself. And we just interviewed not long before. And he, then he has the gall to ask me as I'm handing a Green Lantern book to be signed, wearing a Green Lantern shirt and a Green Lantern hat, are you a Green Lantern fan? <laughs> <laughs> I know who it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I don't like to talk disparagingly of... Of people, especially when they've given us some of their time, but uh, he and I get into an argument on Twitter over something, and <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have to share the story off mic sometime because I don't want to say it on mic. But it was pretty funny. We got into a fight over something. He tried to tweet me something to prove his point, and then he deleted all of his tweets about it. <laughs> it was a little crazy, um, but yeah, that, I, I've loved having interviews. Uh, we haven't had one uh, since the Liam Sharp interview, but. I've really enjoyed talking to people about the creative process and trying to pick their brain and you end up learning a little bit more. Uh, one interview I'd, I'd love to do at some point is Peter Tomasi. He was, uh, he was the one that told me that Grant Morrison was going to be doing Green Lantern before it broke. And, and it was funny. I was at a convention with him and the rumors were out that he was going to be doing the book, that the Grant Morrison was going to be doing a, a Green Lantern book. And I'm talking to him and he signed my books and he, he, he knew who I was because he'd read some of my reviews and stuff. And and we're chit-chatting and he was very appreciative for all the kind words during his run on Green Lantern Corps. And uh, he goes, so you know who's going to be writing the book? So I, of course, tried to play coy and like, well, yeah, I know who's going to be in the book. You know, <laughs> so he starts to talk about it. And, you know, he's, he's not mentioning Grant Morrison by name, but he's alluding to the fact that it's Grant Morrison. So I'm playing along, you know, and and then I said, well, you know, you never know which version of Grant Morrison you're going to get. And he goes, exactly. So that was like, OK, he just confirmed the rumors. But again, I can't I can't say anything publicly about it because I don't want to betray confidence. And that's one of the things we've always tried to do is if somebody confides information to me, as much as it would be great to break a headline, I just my, my personal integrity means more. You know, the, the person asked me not to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. You're not that guy, man. No, oh, don't be, don't be a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, we've always tried to, you know, we've always to when we've covered news and things, we've always tried to make sure it's a legit news and not rumors. And if we talk about a rumor, we like really go out of our way to say this is a rumor because what, the way things seem to work now is somebody creates a rumor and it gets out there and then another media outlet grabs it and reprints it and eventually you've got enough people saying the same thing that people take it as fact right mm -hmm. and we also do we also do a good job of like um well not only explaining the rumor thing but whenever we're going to talk about something we give it enough time for it to be out before we spoil it you know yeah, like Suicide Squad. If we talked about that or whatever the case, whatever it may be, we wait for a while before, you know, it's been out for a while in the general public, and all the other spoilers have already been released and whatever the case may be. So, but that you know that's that's the montage of your show, Myron. I mean, it's it's always been that way. It's always been user friendly, and you know, and the the people genuinely have been friendly. Besides that, once negative interaction with that fellow a while back but outside of that i mean you know i think the one thing i'd w I want moving forward with our show is to get more female uh feedback you know listeners if there is any out there and and get their feedback and maybe get some you know one-on-one -on -one time with them on the show i think it'd be kind of cool 
Yeah, yeah, we we really have not had a lot of listener feedback yeah. from from female listeners. We had uh, back when, uh, gosh, what was it when Jeff Johns was leaving the book? I think it might have been that. No, we did a uh, we did a a, a, sh- a a live event on Google Hangouts talking about the finale of Greenland and the animated series, and I had a couple of female people on then. And, and it was great just to have other perspectives. But, yeah, unfortunately, it seems to be uh, just the guys that want to speak up. And I, I hope female fans of Green Lantern don't feel um, intimidated to be on the show or that they're going to be treated in, you know, in, in, a, in a way that's not professional and polite because that's certainly not the case. Uh, you and I are both mar- yeah. married guys and are very respectful of people. Right, and you can't tell me there's not female listeners out there. I mean, with the popularity of Jessica Cruz, I'd find that hard to believe. And maybe because I'm not a, a fan of Jessica Cruz, they don't want to talk about it because they know I don't like her. I don't know. That could be, but I, I spread the love about Jessica Cruz, and I've been very forthcoming about that since day one about her. So all females, feel free. Right in. We'd love to hear from you. You know, I think you need to start talking better about Simon Baz because we haven't had any Muslim people on either. That's true. <laughs> maybe we can find another Muslim character I can bring up just so I can have Muslim people on the show that'd be great I'm okay with that doesn't have to be Simon though <laughs> Simon is your guy huh oh god I mean that yeah. joke's been that joke's been going since that dude's been around <laughs> it hasn't let up either I don't think there's been a show went by where it hasn't been some kind of slam against Simon but it's all in due fun I mean you know our fandom they I mean well with it. Just because I don't like the guy or like the character doesn't mean I don't I don't like somebody who does. I mean, it's just that's the one thing we fight about or not fight about, but that's the one thing that we we strongly encourage with people. You know, it's like, hey, you have an opinion too, and that's fine. I'm going to respect it. You know, as yeah. I hope they would mind. And you know, I just rail to have fun. It's like Batman. I can't stand Batman. Yeah, yeah. B- Bill Ixnay on the Atman Bay. God. Oh, what's 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 the deal with Batman? What's uh, why don't you like him? I mean, uh, how can seven have, million people be wrong? We don't have not enough <laughs> show time to explain all the wrong things about Batman. <laughs> but please let me understand. Please let uh, let the understanding known that Batman's a seller. I get it. He's popular. He makes money. They have to have him. He's a common character. He's been around. Everybody knows who he is. And I understand the importance of the character. I'm just tired of the oversaturation. I'm just over it. I mean, it's like I'm not even going to ask you about Robin. I don't even know about Robin that much. <laughs> I really I, I'm just I know. <laughs> poor Robin. I Nobody felt knows bad. anything about Robin or Robin. Yeah, I don't. I don't know much about Robin. I don't even read. I I couldn't even tell you the last time I read a Batman book. To be honest with you, and it's, than, it's it's hard these days not to pick up a DC book and not have Batman in it. Right. I mean, and then every every week they got new releases. It's like. 80% of the books that are coming out are Batman related. Didn't they just announce two mm. uh, two new Batman books? They just announced two Batman yeah. events. Well, it yeah. almost feels like when you read a comic in DC and Batman's like just shows up in the background, the audience cheers, you know, like yeah. his cameo. He's like, I'm just getting coffee. And then he takes off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People would be happy about that. There'd be more written about that than the movie itself. You know, it's like, <laughs> God. Anyway, so those have been my two, my two, uh, guys that i loathe <laughs> but whatever <laughs> well guys my uh my power ring is blinking again so we've got a voicemail it looks like Good so time. uh go ahead power ring and play the next voicemail message green lanterns myron bill and phil we have an audio transmission coming from the guardians of the universe audio feedback transmitting in three two one podcast of oa this is Guardians of the Universe from Facebook, and I am just calling to wish you a happy 200th episode and to thank you for all the good guidance you have given, especially through the Grant Morrison series recently. And I look forward to all the retro reviews of the Jeff Johns run as that is everyone's favorite run, of course, and we look forward to that. So hopefully you can continue that, and 
here's to another 200 shows. All right. Well, thanks, Guardians of the Universe. You know, he actually did sound like a Guardian of the Universe. Um, you know, thanks for the kind words. 200's a lot, you know, and I, I can't say this enough. This is this has been Myron. This is Myron's kid, you know. I mean, 200 years old, you know, and him and Bill, you know, started this thing and. I was just lucky enough to get on board with it. You know, I came along at a an opportune time, which is kind of it's kind of random how I came along. I just I think I just messaged you, Myron, about you know, hey, if you're ever looking for me to come on the show, you know, let me know. I'd love to be on again. And you're like, oh, funny, you should mention. <laughs> <laughs> you got Myron at a vulnerable time. <laughs> I did. I did. I picked. I picked him up when he was down. <laughs> yeah, <he's, laughs> you were like prime pickings. <laughs> um, I tell you what, man. When you said that, I was like super excited. I was like, oh my god, yeah. Well, it, <laughs> I was like, it, I, and then I felt bad because I was like, well, I don't want Bill to go because I, I mean I love listening to Bill. I, I mean, and it's funny because I've listened to all the podcasts all the way up until the point when I started. And I haven't listened. To, I haven't listened to him since. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's funny the evolution of the show. I mean, you you call it my baby, but it was really Bill's baby. You know, I I started doing the blog of Oa just you know, and, and we have recounted the story before, but because of my love of the franchise and and so on. And Bill, you were you were doing Get Your Geek on Radio, and we're looking for radio content. So our local comic shop owner kind of introduced the two of us together. Um, and I know that was after you interviewed the the Elmira Bigfoot Hunter. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was a uh, uh, my low point in my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, <laughs> so. But no, no, I I remember that just that was kind of odd. You thought I was picking you up at the comic book store. And um, so it was awkward to begin with. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) No, it was um, it was just I remember just, yeah, I'm like, hey, uh, you know, I'm I'm doing this radio um, online radio and I'm looking for content. It's called Get Your Geek On. And uh, it was it was the goal was to be the. NPR of all things geek, um, comics, video games, everything, movies. And um, I remember approaching you and you're like, no, I'm just a blog. I'm like, oh, and then we had a chance happening. I applied for a job and you happened to be on the interview. And uh, I was like, hey, I know this guy. And you're like, hey, I know this guy. And I think uh, it was the Ryan Reynolds movie that kind of, I think we, we we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Just, you know. Well, like, it, was, it, it was funny. You were interviewing for a position that was going to end up working in the district that I was the technology director for. So I'm like, well, cool. I'll get, have somebody I can talk comics to on an almost daily basis. And yeah. <laughs> not that that interview questions were a little like they were kind of like softballs there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want the job? You like Green Lantern? Good, Don. Yeah. Come on. Hey, nobody else know who knew who John Broom was, so I wasn't going to hire him. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So we started talking and you're like, well, maybe, you know, cause I think, I think the get your geek on radio thing was a great idea, but I think it, it didn't, it didn't take on maybe the way you, you thought it was going to. And, and then you were looking for other content and you're like, well, this gives me almost an, an immediate gratification of doing an episode and getting it out there. And you're like, well, let's do a Green Lantern podcast. And I, I had done radio in college, but I'm still to this day, I'm still an introvert to, to some extent. And so the thought of sitting here and talking about comic books, I, I just was like, I don't know if I can do that. And you were like, oh, yeah, we can do it. And and so th- that was the, the kernel of the idea that, that formed the show. And then when it, it was time for you to move on and, and you know, you, you would time when we started the show, you didn't have kids. And you know how it is when, when you've got y- a young family that takes a lot of your time away. And, and and that was taking a lot of your time from from your family and or from you to be able to do some some other creative things you wanted to do. So you left the show and I was I was really like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I should like do a contest or something. And then Phil, you messaged me out of the blue and I'm like, well, hit problem solved, you know, <laughs> hey, Phil, Phil rhymes with bill. It's great. It was easy. Yeah. Right. You know, that, that was one of the, be one of the interview questions is does your name rhyme with bill? Yeah, that's uh, perfect. No, I, I think that's great that you, you know, Phil, I mean, it was just what a great fill in, I think, to Myron, um, cyclopedic knowledge. And then your level of fandom really, you know, is a good combination. 
um, for the medium. And I think that's a big bonus for all the fans. Um, I, I mean, we'll talk about maybe the fans of Simon Baz might have a different view, but. <laughs> it, it, well, it was interesting in the beginning, the dynamic was, Bill, you were you were you were the leader of the show. You were asking the questions and you were kind of leading the conversation, which helped me over the introverted part. But you also represented a lot of the fans at the time because this was at the height of the Jeff Johns run, and there were a lot of new Green Lantern fans. So you really you were an avatar for the listener who maybe didn't know certain things. And you would ask those questions. And so it, it made it very organic and was exactly what was needed. You flash forward a little bit and now the people that are that are listening to the show you know, the the John's run is over with. And so the people that have stuck around are the long-term fans. And so, Phil, you entered the, the, the role of being in the show. And I kind of stepped up to become kind of the leader of the show and took on all the all the behind-the-scenes production stuff, whereas before Bill would Bill would edit and produce and I would publish. So right. I took on the rest of, of that part of it and had to learn some new skills, which was good for me. It allowed me to stretch myself a little bit. But then you came on with a different perspective because of your history with the characters. So then it was more like two two veteran Green Lantern fans talking about the books at the comic shop and you're listening in on the conversation. That's about how it felt, you know, and I was real I remember my first episode, I was real nervous. I was like, Man, what do I do? What do I say? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> what the hell? And then every episode that came after that, I think it was like the first, I don't know, probably handful of them. I was like I kept on amping myself up for it. I'm like, okay. I'm going to record. I'm a little nervous. What am I going to say? I hope I don't say enough. Or what if I don't say enough? Or, you know, and then I'm sitting here questioning myself. But, you know, I mean, talking to you has made it, uh, you know, a hell of a lot easier. You know, you've just been, you're fluid like me. And, you know, our discussion topics are just, they really, really flow really well. And to be quite honest with you, I mean, I, I, I feel like I've known you like for a long time. And, we've become such good friends over the course of time. And of course, by extension, I've become good, good friends with Bill, and, you know, cause I always ask how he's doing. And, um, you know, I've been around you for a while now and, you know, we, we text back and forth all the time and, you know, I get to talk to you every, we used to get to talk to you every week, you know, for an hour or so. And, you know, it, it became one of those moments where, um, the show filled this like little niche that I wanted and, and it became part of it. And it's like, I look forward to it every time that it happens. There has never been a time where I've never not looked forward to it. Unfortunately, I, I would have to say it was around the times when it was a little rough when, when my, my mother passed last year, you know, and then my grandmother passed just recently. And, uh, it, it was a little tough during those, but even by that extension, uh, it helped alleviate some of it you know, some of the sadness in it and, uh, you know, it kept me upbeat about, about certain things. And then of course there's Simon Baz. It's just been my anchor going way, way back. So I <laughs> have to deal with that. <laughs> to deal keep with me that. grounded. Keep me <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it's, it's been great with you guys. It's been great. I mean, in, in one of, one of my fondest memories was getting on the, the lantern cast and, you know, all four of us, you know, going back and forth and stuff like the round table discussion. And it was just a great time because, you know, it was like us just sitting here talking about times past and everything like that. And those guys talking to us about their stuff and we're talking to them about ours. And it's a, it's a cool community to be a part of. And I think it's a growing, growing community and it's getting, getting larger every day. And I'm glad I got in on it at the time that I did. Yeah. And, and I think, and, and I hope you feel this way, Phil is, Sometimes you, you talk about the show being my show. I've never looked at it as as my show. You know, when when Bill and I were doing it, I looked at it as our show. And even though you've joined you joined in later on, I feel like you're an equal partner in this. And so, if you have a creative idea, you bring it to me, and we throw it in the show. It's like, why not try it? You know, that kind yeah. of thing. And and it, it, it's meant to be a creative outlet for you as much as it is for myself. So I hope that you feel that that you've been treated in a way that that you feel like this isn't like you're not along for the ride you're part of the ride oh i absolutely do because because you and i i mean when i when i think about the past episodes that i listened to with you and bill i mean we we don't do it in a similar way because you know we we've, we've included different aspects that you guys haven't done and while at the same time i'm jealous of some of the stuff that you guys have done like like the the guy gardner thing the interviews thing i mean every time i hear it it's just hilarious you know you know, it's 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 fun stuff, and 
And while there are similarities where you guys have talked to uh, content creators and stuff, and so have we, um, we've we've added different stuff, whereas and you guys had different stuff. But again, if you keep it the same all the time, it becomes stagnant, you know, and it becomes it becomes boring. You know, you you have to do different creative voices and different creative outlets for the fandoms to, to change things up, you know, to make them feel included, which, which is what I'm really glad about the podcast is that we've had more of an inclusion lately because, you know, people, more fans are writing in and stuff and, and sharing and everything. And, and that's, that's part of what's, what's best about being in the comic book world. You know, there, there's great people out there and uh, we've always been respectful of them. And just much as as much as they have of us, you know, and and I we say this all the time. We all we all have our likes, you know. It's okay for everybody to like. It's okay for you to like Simon Baz. I, I like you because you like Simon Baz. Just because I don't like Simon Baz, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. No, I mean just because you have bad, just because you have poor taste doesn't mean you're not at all. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that that's the best part about this, you know, and and it's wholesome, you know, and. And it's friendly, and uh, I'll tell you what it's it's a tough time. It's tough sometimes going through those hours, bite my tongue, not cursing because you work in a public school and a high school all day. You're 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 prone to cursing all the time, and and I do it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's and I do it at home, but then when the podcast starts, I'm I'm usually pretty good about it. And I, I think Denise made a comment one time. She said, "Well, I don't understand how you can go that long without cur without without dropping the curse words when you." can't even do it outside of it <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah that wholesome we're like you're like the banana bread of podcast <laughs> right right <laughs> well so, yeah I've, I've always felt that way myron you, you you've made this a home for me and and uh, i can't take you enough well gentlemen we have more listener feedback so yep. why don't we uh take a listen to the next message our next celebration comes from Thomas. Message transmission in three, two, one. Hey Myron, Phil, and Bill. Happy 200. I've been listening to your show for about three years, but I have listened to your entire back catalog multiple times. My favorite episode to show people is the Guy Gardner interview. Another personal favorite is Myron's reaction to the GL animated series being canceled. Even though it's not one of your prouder moments on the show, it was nice to know someone else was as angry as I was. Since this is probably my best chance to tell this story I just wanted to share the time I met you and Bill. It was back in 2016 at the River Road Expo. My friend had gone the year before and introduced me to the blog of OA Facebook group. I had been a member of the group for a few years but I never listened to the podcast, sorry, Myron was at his station with his wife. After visiting the table and chatting I continued around the convention and came to Bill's table as he was selling and signing his Ashes book, he spotted my GL hat and asked me about my interest in GL. When I said I knew about the show he proceeded to go oh well hey it's me, Bill. And I was so embarrassed that I didn't know who he was that I was unable to respond to any of his questions even simple ones like can you recite any lantern oaths. And just to be fair and spread the love just want to give a shout out to Phil. At least once an episode Phil has a great speech, whether you are responding to feedback, expressing your opinion on a book, or talking about the importance of everyone having their likes and dislikes. You're always so well spoken and never come off as preachy. Keep your power rings charged. Thomas, uh, thank you again. Um, you know, I'm, I, wow, to go back and to listen to all the episodes. Um, I mean, again, a decade's worth of episodes to go back and listen to all those. And then uh, to also tell the story about meeting me at the River Road Expo. That's that's crazy. I kind of remember that. And I do remember, you know, I was, trust me, I was, there's no reason to be embarrassed. I was just as kind of blown away that somebody even, was listening to that and to bump into them is kind of very random. Um, when you think about, you know, when you, you know, Phil and uh, Meyer were just talking about, you know, having fans in Australia, you know, and then all of a sudden you're bumping into somebody and then talking to them. So no, that's great. I hope you enjoyed the ashes too. Um, but no, that's a crazy, crazy story. It is. And, and I remember doing those shows and I, I miss doing those kind of local shows we used to have here in our area where we could go and do do something. It would give us a chance to promote things locally. But it was I, I remember that 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 show. And it, I think it was the first time where we had somebody 
who was local who was listening to the show. I think we we thought, well, there's no other Green Lantern fans in this area. <laughs> They're going to be all from right. somewhere else, right? <laughs> and uh, so you're sitting there, and you know, I was there as as as, uh, as Thomas mentions. I was there with my wife doing my side of things, and Bill, you were off uh, selling your Ashes book, which probably I think at the time it had just come out, uh, and it was your first comic. Yeah, somewhere around there, yeah. And uh, and it was just it was a fun time to have those kind of experiences and be able to interact with fans face to face was was fun. And I I was there I, with my table and I have a a miniature guardian I made out of a Halloween mask and a a, a children's choir robe and made a, a little guardian photo op and was selling power <laughs> rings. And at the time I think that was when we had the Seafoam Lantern T shirts that we were selling at conventions and stuff like that. And it was just a lot of fun. Uh, but you know, I, I, and what a trooper to, to jump in three years and, and listen and then go all the way back and listen to all of them uh, is, is uh, Impressive. that that's willpower right there. <laughs> yeah, no, really, really. <laughs> and, and all of his callbacks to the guy Gardner interview in the animated series is things that we've, we've talked about early, earlier, but um uh, I, I'm 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 glad that those things resonate with people because again, when we're on this side of the mic, we are talking about stuff and we don't know if it's resonating with the listeners unless we get feedback. So sometimes when we don't hear from from the audience, we're not sure is really is anybody listening to it or you know do they care enough to to say something? Maybe we're not doing maybe we're doing something wrong. So this kind of feedback that we've been getting through all throughout this show has been very important. It, it charges me up to hear people talk about things that resonated with them that they still remember now. Um, that, that to me is fantastic. How about you, Phil? It's not on like space where the Lantern Corps is, you know, you're sending messages out there, but you're not sure who you're reaching, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and um, I always find it cool when somebody uses some of the catchphrases we've come up with, like, you know, keep your power ring charged and those kind of yeah. things. Yeah. And, and and when you get those feedback, <clears throat> like you said, I, every so often when we start doing our episodes, I'm always anxious to see what the listener feedback is. That's usually the first part I read because it's it's fun hearing from different people. And you've always mentioned this from time to time, you know, across the globe, you know, how many people we're reaching. You know, we've had people from all over, you know, and it, and it's and it's great that you can. It's great to know that those people are taking the time out from their life from whatever part of the globe they're on just to comment in on a podcast that like you said you're creating and you don't know who you're reaching you know and you know I, I like what thomas said about me not being preachy you know that's the last thing i want to be is preachy because i'm not that type of person preachy means you're trying to you're trying to sway the other side and i'm not trying to sway anybody you know i i get my input just as much as myron gives his input you know and sometimes we're a little bit more passionate about it depending on what the circumstances are surrounding it but at the same time, you know, it's we're not preaching to you. We're just we're just we're just telling you stories and, and you know and, and telling our perspective on on a medium and you know, giving our opinions and inputs, you know. It's not meant to sway your decisions, it's just meant for us to convey and you can either <laughs> I mean you either you either like what we say or, or sometimes you don't, you know. It's just but that's the nature of the comic book industry, you know, and it, and I, I think sometimes that gets lost with people that get really, really too charged up. When it comes to heated debate, you know, it's like, whoa, hold on. It doesn't need to get heated. You know, I mean, it, it, you know, the Avengers is maybe not better than the Justice League or whoever is better. Who cares? I mean, really, at the end of the day, who cares? You know, I like Green Lantern because I like Green Lantern. But am I going to say he's better than everybody else? Well, sure I am because I'm biased and because he's I'm a fan of his. Well, I, but I am man enough to say that he could probably get beat by a lot of other people, too, it, but it doesn't mean everything's better than everybody else. We're all fans. We all have it. We all love it. It's interesting to go and look at the statistics. I mean, I, when, I, when I go and look at the global map, we've hit a lot of places on this planet, which surprise me. You know, we've, we've had 70 downloads in South Africa. That's, um, that's really interesting. Some in India. We've got one lone person in Russia uh, who's hiding <laughs> somewhere, afraid that somebody, the government knows he's listening to our show. Uh, or, or it's Putin himself. Yeah, <laughs> Putin is a fan. That's right. That's right. There's was one person in South Korea. Um, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to look at those from things. North Korea in there. There's nobody from North Korea. Huh? Nope. No, I think we've been blocked. Uh, by state if radio. we did, uh, yeah, it'd be uh, what's his name, Kim Kim Young. Kim Young. There. Yeah. 
I uh, yeah, I don't think anybody else would be able to. Um, yeah. The um, no, and the it's amazing how far reaching it, it can be, and um, and then how local it can be. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. fascinating. It really is. Um, I remember the first time Billy, you and I got an email from uh, the young gentleman from Ayrshire. <laughs> oh yeah, from Scotland. Yeah, yeah, from Scotland. We were like, that was I think the first time we heard from somebody from outside the United States, and we were like, oh my word, people. You know, I think that was the dawning of there really is an audience for this content, even though we know that you know comic books are a niche, and DC is a niche, and Green Lantern is a niche within a niche within a niche. Um, that there are people that that care and and this content is important to them. And I I think our goal has always been to enhance the fan experience. And I really do hope we've done that for people over the years. I agree. But uh, Hey, since we're, since we're on a roll, let's, why don't we listen to the next one too? So power ring, why don't you go ahead and play the next one while we're at it? The next message is from Jack transmitting in three, two, one. Hello, Phil, Bill and Myron. Congratulations on 200 podcast episodes. In episode number 199 you mentioned the Green Lantern making the Netflix top 10 list. It is fun to reflect on the 2011 Green Lantern movie because the movie also marks the start of the Blog of Oa podcast. That being said, I think it is relevant to talk about my experience with the movie. I never found the hate for the movie that individuals, even Green Lantern fans, have. When I saw it in theaters, I remember enjoying it, but because of the negative opinions on the movie, I decided not to revisit it for some time. Recently, I decided to watch the movie again on Bomax and I was pleasantly surprised by how good the movie was. Even the choices made with Parallax seemed to work for me, and no Parallax was not a brown <coughs> storm. I just will never get the hate for this movie or DC movies in general. Again, congratulations on the 200th episode. Blog of Oa has been my favorite blog, I enjoy the positivity and support of the Green Lantern brand. And of course, Hal is the Green Lantern. Thank you. Jack. Well, thank you, Jack. Um, you know, thank you very much for the congratulations on the 200 podcast. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of with you as far as the hate. I mean, this podcast started with the Green Lantern movie, and um, I think we were both a little shell shocked, Myron. Afterwards, I think we were trying to figure out how we felt about it. Um, but I don't I don't think I I don't like to think of people hated. I don't think it helps when Ryan Reynolds say stuff about it um, and kind of pokes fun at it. But at the same time, I mean, I can name a lot worse superhero movies. I can name, you know, better ones, but I mean, it was a it, for the time and what they were trying to do with the green lantern. Um, I think the only thing that would make me as a green lantern fan kind of maybe uh, as you put it, uh, Phil, because you, you are working in public education using the lingo throwing shade at it is um, that I, there might've been a lot of behind the scenes problems as far as too many cooks in the kitchen, too many people trying to pull it in different directions. Um, And that, that's kind of the disappointment I would feel as a fan. Um, But overall, I I wouldn't call it, I don't think you could really hate the movie. I think it was, I think it was a decent movie and it serves its purpose. Yeah, I think, you know, lots of times it gets put on the top 10 worst comic book movie list when I'm like, wow, you haven't watched enough comic book movies because there's a lot worse ones yeah, than, than that movie. You know, really. um, yeah. I think as as a Green Lantern fan at the time, there was the enthusiasm of, oh, my gosh, I'm finally going to get to see my favorite hero in the flesh on the big screen. And that enthusiasm kind of overrides some of your objective criticism. And then after a while, you, you look at it. And I think if anything, I, I think you hit it on the on the head, Bill, is that. This was a mistake due to corporate the corporate mentality and Warner Brothers not letting DC um, pilot their own ship. And I think Jeff Johns at the time had the ability to be DC's Kevin Feige, but Warner Brothers wasn't going to let him do it. You know, even up and up through Justice League, they were still dictating the length of the movie and the things they wanted. And rather than trusting DC to know their audience and to make the film, they got too heavy handed, and it really showed in this film where you had disagreements between the director and the studio and and the, the studio made him pick Ryan Reynolds even though it wasn't his first choice and so that created tension on the set and and some of the script decisions were way off and they had too many cooks writing the script uh, and things were taken away that could have been used if different decisions had been made and and so on I, I think looking back 
it's more of a disappointment in that it wasn't as good as we know Green Lantern can be, but it's still fun to watch. Yeah, I agree. I need to watch it again. I haven't watched it in a while. I, I watched it. Uh, I've watched it on HBO Max when it was on, and I watched it on Netflix because I was like, okay, well, let's get the numbers higher because, you know, Warner Brothers <laughs> pays attention to that stuff. You know, when you're making headlines for being in the top 10 in Netflix across the country, maybe somebody pays attention to that. And maybe we'll finally get some forward momentum on this Green Lantern Corps movie that's been in development for, gosh, who knows how long. Come on, man. That's too That's too much intellectual thinking for Warner Brothers. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way they're thinking that way. Well, kind of an interesting thing. I kind of I kind of mentioned uh, Ryan Reynolds and how he kind of would say certain things about uh, Green Lantern. Um, he was on a podcast. I don't know if you listened to the podcast Smartless with Jason Bateman. No, I have not listened to that. Uh, it's a great podcast. It's called Smartless, and they always have like some interview. It's uh, Jason Bateman, Sean Hayes from um, Will and Grace, and uh, Will Arnett. And the they're three friends, and they always bring on somebody, you know, like, a, and it's everybody from, you know, Kamala Harris to you know George Clooney to interesting people in the news. So it's 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 quite a good one. Um, anyways, they had Ryan Reynolds on, and Ryan Reynolds mentioned Green Lantern, and they, the, the question was asked was like, you know, you you took an iconic character, and you know, you were able to. Most people would say that career. After that movie, and they were kind of talking poorly of the movie, and Ryan Reynolds made a kind of an interesting point. I never thought of it. He goes, "My biggest problem with Green Lantern was that he disappointed so many fans. Mm. He he took, you know, he felt like he, you know, that movie he could have done better." with that not him himself but like everybody could have handled that better it was just kind of an interesting take on you know where you know he wasn't necessarily bad but just saying yeah like you know we that was his biggest why he felt it was so bad so you know it was kind of nice to hear that he even felt like wow you know if the studio was a little bit you know there there seemed to be some undertones of that yeah, I think I think listening to some of the things that he said, I I don't think for a second that he tried to make a bad movie. I think he earnestly wanted to make a good movie because he's a fan of comic book properties too, and he knew how much it meant to the fans. When you right. go back and you watch, the, I'll never forget the scene that you can you can see it on YouTube. It was a San Diego Comic Con, and a little kid talked about the oath, and he said the oath for the kid, and then gave the kid a power ring, and you could you could tell just the earnestness behind it. And unfortunately, you know, it hurt his career a little bit, and he took a lot of stick for it to the point at which he himself didn't watch the movie himself until recently. And then he's, he said, he's, you know, it really you know, wasn't as bad as you th- I thought it was. He's, he's doing all right. Yeah, <laughs> he like uh, he. Uh, I mean, he owns a what? He owns liquor and uh, a liquor company, mobile company, and uh, he just had a big hit with Freed Guy. So I think he'll live. But it, I think he. Uh, I I think Myron, you were saying earlier, it's like one of those you're you're seeing with the problems with like the studio just wasn't letting DC make the movie they wanted. And I bet Ryan Reynolds had ideas of what the movie he wanted the movie to be too. And it just wasn't there. And it was, I think that's the only thing that really held back Green Lantern overall. I think it was a, you know, a decent, you know, a decent addition to the whole Green Lantern universe. Yeah. I think it was just a victim of the studio mentality. Yeah, absolutely. But anyway, what people also fail to realize, too, just to jump in on it, is that the, the medium is, I mean, 2011 was 10 years ago. The, the way the movies are nowadays, it, they've, they've changed a lot since then. That was early. That was a few years after Iron Man even came out. Yeah. You know? I'll, I'll so. say it was better than the Thor movie that came out that year. Oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yep. But anyway, uh, let's, uh, while we're on a roll, I want to do, do some more listener feedback. So, Power Ring, why don't you give us the next one? Our next congratulations comes from Russell, who manages the Green Lantern Day-to-Day project on Twitter. Commencing transmission in 3, 2, 1. I wanted to take a second to congratulate you on your 200th episode. I am new to podcasts and currently listen when I'm able to. I can hear the love you have for the franchise and I appreciate the honesty you share with the listeners. I also enjoy the humor the two of you share and the intense love y'all have for Simon. 
I also wanted to thank you for your support of my Green Lantern Day 2 Day project. Again, congratulations. I look forward to the future. Hey, Russell. Yeah, thanks for the shout out. And uh, for anybody listening, uh, Russell runs the uh, Green Lantern Day to Day on Twitter. And uh, uh, he puts out, you know, different various issue covers from, from, you know, past and present or whatnot. And it's really cool because, you know, artwork on the cover art is one of the one of the gems of the comic book world and, you know, variant covers and all these covers are made. And that's the first thing you see that attracts your attention to whatever's in the book. And, uh, it's cool. Some of the stuff that he puts on there, cause it's a lot of issues that I haven't seen. And of course, a lot of stuff that I just love and adore, you know, and it's, you know, and he, he does it a lot. I mean, like it's usually once or twice a day, if I'm not mistaken. And it, it, it's, it's fun seeing what he puts out. You know, I really appreciate the, um, the shout out. I'm glad you wrote in. Um, and yeah, I, I know you appreciate the love for Simon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I really applaud Russell's dedication because he does this every day. He yeah. gives you the covers of books that came out on that day in history. So he's mining the entire history all the way back to 1940 and putting the covers out every day of any book that came out on that day. And sometimes he's, he's he's bringing in the creators that worked on some of those books if they're if they're on social media and in Twitter and and includes them in it and it, it sparks conversation on the artwork of the cover or people may comment on the story on any of the stories that might have resonated with them. I think it's just a great form and activity and and this guy's been doing this for a while now and just and it's impressive. So if if you're not following Russell on Twitter. Uh, if, if you follow the blog of Oa, I retweet it every day because I think it's it's great content. Uh, mm. So look look for a retweet and, and then follow him yourself because he's worth following. Uh, I, I think it's great content. Agreed. All right, let's do uh, let's do another one. So Power Ring, go ahead and let us know what is coming up next. The next message comes from Ken, who has some questions for the team. I will break each question into its own transmission. Just tell me to play the next question when you are ready. Initiating segmented transmission in 3, 2, 1. Hi Myron and Phil. In honor of your 200th episode, I wanted to share some fun questions for you guys after my other comments have been so negative. There are a lot of them so I would appreciate it if you answered them one at a time, I separated them by letter. A. If you could retcon anything from Green Lantern history, what would it be? In a similar fashion, who would you bring back to life? I would easily bring back the Blue Lanterns and possibly Kat Matui. Well, I think this is a really great and interesting set of questions that, that Ken's going to pose to us. Because uh, it's not about the show, it's about Green Lantern in general. So it gives us a chance for all three of us to kind of share our, our opinions. And, and the first part here is about what would we retcon out of history if we were given the opportunity. Uh, I'd retcon all the Human Lanterns but Hal out of history. But no, no seriously though, <laughs> ser- seriously what I would retcon is this current run out of existence along with Teen Lantern and Joe Mullane. That's what I would retcon out. Uh, the, the, <laughs> I, I know Phil, he was going to crack you up. The, this current run, uh, I think it is the worst Green Lantern run in the history of the series, uh, the history of the character. Uh, I think it's crap. Uh, there, I said it. Um, <laughs> and he said it on the 200th episode. <laughs> and, 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 and Teen Lantern Kelly I, I'm, come on and I, yeah I, I, let's not go too much further down that road it'll be a rant um, but I would I would I would retcon the crap out of that run um, it'd be it'd be like some bad meth experience that some alien creature had uh, so what would I bring, bring back I like the idea of bringing back the Blue Lanterns but I also like the idea of maybe bringing back Bzzzt or Muck Muck Muck, muck, I agree. Poor muck, muck. Yeah. <laughs> Poor muck, muck. Um, <laughs> I would, I would, I would, I would say, uh, I don't know if it, it's, it's, I don't know, I can point, pinpoint it to one specific thing, but I, I, um, I'm not going to go down the bashing of Simon Baz, but I do That's think. That's why I was we, going. But well, yeah, I figured. So I'll let you have your fun with that, Phil. But uh, I, I'm thinking in general. I think there was a point, and I remember talking about this back and when, where we were like, while wow, we had six titles out there, and I was like, are we getting overly saturated with you know human 
uh, Green Lanterns. And um, I was I was fine with Hal and John Stewart and um, you know and and maybe Guy, you know. But it just seemed like uh, Kyle. Then then you kind of got used to four, and you're like, okay, there's four, and there's a whole core behind that. And then it just seemed it's starting to get a little. It's getting a little crazy, even the core itself. But um, I guess, yeah, I guess what I was going to wreck kind of be like, you know, really pare it down to get like to really some. I wouldn't have been fine if they just said how. They just go how. We really focus on, you know, the character itself. And I, I think that would be my one change. I know that's kind of a controversial one because people do have, you know, grown to love a lot of the different types of lanterns. But yeah, I think uh, it would be nice just to keep how as the lantern you know just as bruce wayne is the batman i'm getting all (laughs) teary-eyed yeah i did i didn't want to yeah i know where to hit the buttons (laughs) was emotional but like like that i even brought up batman too just to fire up phil for his simon bass lines here (laughs) it really really helped it really really did kind of add to it yeah yeah that's what i'd go with i just buy simon you know, later, uh, it, it, it more so that if he didn't even exist entirely altogether, you know, I, I, now I, I say that with, with the utmost respect to the way I, if you're going to create a character, don't create a character just for character's sake, just because you're trying to make some message to whatever, I don't know, to whatever, social group or whoever you're trying to appeal to you know what i mean i I mean characters are created for all kinds of reasons and i understand that but at the same time if you're going to create a character don't just do it in a vacuum and hope it's going to stick or whatever and then all of a sudden have a flailing person not knowing where they fit in anymore you know i just I, i hate when they do that to characters and they do that so often with a lot of people with a lot of stuff that they write and, you know, Simon Baz was, was I, I feel like Simon Baz was, was part of that characterization. You know, I, he didn't grab me out the get-go, and I never really appealed to him. So, like, that would be the one thing I'd wreck on. Um, as far as bringing back, I don't know if, bring, he, he doesn't count as bringing back to life, but if I had to bring somebody back, I'd, I'd, I'd want to bring back Larflees. I don't, I feel like Larflees should be more included in the Green Lantern universe more only because I like them and it's because I'm just, you know, being selfish. (laughs) All right. Powering. What's the next question? V, if you could have a team of seven lanterns across the emotional spectrum, who would you select to protect the universe in a new guardians fashion? All right. My seven lanterns. Let's go with Al Jordan, black hand, water fleas, Sinestro, Brother Worth, and then I'm going to have to go with Fatality from the Sapphires, and uh, who am I missing? Indigo. Indigo, okay, well, yeah, we're going to have to go with, uh, uh, I guess, hmm. I'm not really sure, I don't know where to choose for the Indigo ones. Okay. Anybody. Doesn't matter who. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 we'll go with Adam when it was in uh, Blackest Night when Adam, oh, became, Adam became uh, well, part of the Indigo tribe. There you go. Uh, for me, um, for Red, I would choose Blees, but if I were in charge, I would make Guy Gardner a Red Lantern and he would be one of my seven. Uh, orange is uh Yellow. I, if, if Guy Gardner were going to be my red, then I would put Arkillo as the yellow lantern I would choose. Uh, but if, if not, I would go with Sora Natu. Green would be Hal. Shocker, right? Uh, blue, again, I would choose St. Walker. But if I had my druthers and I were in charge, I would make Kyle Rayner a blue lantern and he would be the one I would choose. Uh, Indigo, I would go with Iroke or Indigo 1. Uh, and then for Violet, I would do Carol Ferris because I think it could be interesting to have Carol, Kyle, and Hal together. That might be interesting. Well, you know where you're going with that. It's a fan <laughs> show, Myron. Bomb <laughs> chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I forgot it is a family show. Got to insert, uh, got to insert a bass riff there. Myself. What about you, Bill? Um, 
So I, I kind of approach this a little differently. I um, I was going to have more Green Lanterns and less from the emotional spectrum, all the other emotional spectrum, because I, uh, at the end ago, I always felt kind of useless. Um, you know, it was like, eh, I, I don't know. It was like they, they were struggling to find out what to do with the indigo color. Um, but I would have to say, uh, I, I think you got to go with Hal Jordan, but I was going to have Hal Jordan, John Stewart, also in there. Um, big fan of Arkillo. So I, I definitely had Arkillo in there. But you got to also have Sinestro. So right there, I have two, I have two sets of two. From two different cores. Could care less about the Violets. Gotta have St. Walker. St. Walker is a, a, a most certainly. You gotta have Dexstar. Um, and who am I leaving out? Well, Larflees. Because Larflees was, you know, you get a whole army with Larflees. Right, right. And as long as he gets Glomulus back. That that might be who, <laughs> I, that might be who I'd bring back as Glomulus. I forgot about him. Glomulus, yes. Jeez. <laughs> cool great question all right what's the next question see if you could trim the number of human lanterns to four to five characters who would you keep and who would you kill off or retire i would easily keep hal john guy kyle and jess but i would maybe retire hal and include jade or kelly instead well you know i thought this was going to be an easy question ken but then you said i had to choose four or five because <laughs> because if it were up to me i'd reduce it down to hal but if i've got to go down to four or five I would go with Hal, John, Guy, and Kyle. I love the whole four cor- corpsmen part of the Venditti run. I thought he made them work really well together. But I would change it up. I would make Guy a Red Lantern and Kyle a Blue Lantern, like I said. Uh, Simon and Jessica, I would kill off. Uh, Kelly Quintella, I would take her gauntlet away and send her packing back to Earth. And Joe Mullane, uh, I think I would send her off to another universe in the Omniverse where she could just be her own thing. And that if they want to tell stories whether she can, it's her own continuity, it's not connected in any way, shape, or form, I'd be fine with that. And I know I'm missing uh, the young the young boy lantern. Uh, Phil, do you remember which one it is? He's he's in the, the young adult novels. Gosh, don't I haven't read it, so I don't know. But it, uh, it was the one where his grandmother was a green lantern, and he, he inherits his grandmother's ring, and it was an alternate universe thing i would ignore that altogether too um i don't remember the character's name but uh that's what i would do if i were king mine's easy i'll keep it simple how guy how guy kyle and jess everybody else can just go away go ahead bill (laughs) (laughs) Um, i would i would simply keep hal and john and um honestly i don't even know who kelly is (laughs) <laughs> um, I thought that was a mis- I thought that was a typo. Um, so yeah, no, I I would keep it really. I would really pare it down. How and John, um, if I had to go, if you were like, no, you have to have a third. I, I'd probably go guy. Um, I was talking about killing off Kyle before it was cool. Um, <laughs> the um. Yo, before they even got into the Guardians and he became the White Lantern, I was even thinking that would be a great way if he went out. What a great way to like make a big news. He was just big enough to be that character that would have people in shock, but at the same time. Um, yeah, so I was all about Kyle. And then, yeah, Simon, Baz, um, and Jess, I, I just... You you know, Myron, I think I talked about this. My my issue is Jess, and this is where we would disagree, Phil. And it's just um her her character didn't make sense to me. Um the the I kind of got the whole will of overcoming um overcoming some of her anxieties um and depression, but at the same time, I just, I don't know how, you know, like, it, it, it just seemed like it was, it, it was just a weird, again, kind of maybe how you felt towards, you know, Baz is that, you know, it was kind of like, it was something they were just trying to tap into at that point. Um, I would have liked to see another kind of female character or maybe approach it a little bit differently. Um, but no, keep it simple for me. Hal and John, maybe guy. So just to give you the story of Kelly Quintella, the Teen Lantern, 
Um, I'll, I'll give you an abbreviated version of the story and try not to laugh out loud. Um, so, <laughs> Kelly, Quint- Kelly, Kelly Quintella is a preteen uh, who lives in Bolivia, and she comes across a drug dealer having a, a bad drug deal go down with a Green Lantern. And the Green Lantern is not wearing his power ring. He's wearing a gauntlet, which is very similar to Krona's gauntlet. I don't know if you remember Krona's gauntlet. But yeah. Very similar yeah. to that gauntlet, but it's not Krona's gauntlet. It's just a very good facsimile. Uh, somehow the Green Lantern is shot and killed, and in his dying breaths, she kind of takes the gauntlet from him and starts using it. And so she's not really a member of the Green Lantern Corps. She just kind of started to get a little bit of training. But she's basically a preteen girl walking around with a weapon of mass destruction on her arm, and the guardians are seen to be too afraid to take it off of her arm. Uh, and 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 wait a minute here, back up just a little bit. Um, a Green Lantern was doing the drug deal. Yeah, yeah. So he could have been part of the Green Lantern Corps, right? It was it just that he happened he, to have that gauntlet? Uh, no, he was a member of the Corps who we never saw before, uh, and. Don't know why he was doing a drug deal on Earth. I, I never read the actual issues. I, this is just what I've read about what happened. Was um, he selling weed? Yeah, we, we sell weed. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's just one of those things where it wasn't created by Brian Michael Bendis, but he he introduced the character in Young Justice. And why they want to push this character, I don't know. I think it's one of the dumbest things I've ever read. Uh, and Joe Mullane, who, who you're probably also not aware of, is a uh, an Earth cop who was selected by the Guardians to go on a mission to a faraway planet. And she was given, of course, a ring that is not like anybody else's power ring. It's fueled completely differently and has different limitations because the writer didn't know anything about comic books and made up her own crap. Um, but she's a, she's a celebrated science fiction author. And so um, for reasons which i'm not going to get into uh it was promoted as this big thing at dc and now she right now is the green lantern of earth in re- regular continuity oh oh okay yeah right. yeah yeah so that's where we're at that's how we got here um <laughs> <laughs> there's more I, I i we can start talking about the i'll film. stick with hal and john yes that that's a good choice um all right next question d are the Green Lanterns better off with or without the Guardians? Personally, I prefer the DC Rebirth version where John was the leader of the Corps while Gambit sighed, and the Templar Guardians were more there for help. Also, I prefer Mogo as the base of the Corps, not Oa which has been destroyed slash attacked too often. Uh, this this question, I you know, I prefer the Guardians. I, I like having the little blue guys in the background. You know, maybe not so much pulling the strings, but I think sometimes they're often overlooked for even offering some of their wisdom. Now, albeit it might be construed, but like, I still liked having them around. Uh, they're the keepers of the secrets, you know, and there's, there's, it's cool to have that kind of mystery there. Um, uh, I like Mogo being the base of operations. I think I mentioned that on the podcast before I would prefer Mogo to, because it's a mobile base, <laughs> you know, it can go places, you know, and like he mentions here, Oh, it's being destroyed and attacked too often. Well, I mean, Mogo gets around, you can hide it. So there you go, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> no, I um, I think Mogo, I, I do like Mogo. I think Mogo is um, um, an interesting character. Just, you know, again, speaking to that whole space, like you wouldn't expect what like the characters would look like and to have a whole living planet and also the base of operations. I think that's where Oa should be. Um the Guardians, I'm, I'm hit or miss. I, you know, I, I, I've always liked the Ganthets, you know, and, you know, having that nice, and it's nice to have that kind of history. And like you said, Phil, the keeper of the mysteries and everything. But there's part of me that I, I don't know if it was just at the time I was reading, they kind of, it, it seemed like they were always, they were like the pinnacle of the problem. You know, and, you know, and I, so there was part of me that was thinking that, well, maybe, maybe we'd be better off with less guardians or, um, have them be a little bit more mysterious, as you said. Um, and that's where I would be. So I would say I would, I, if you, I only had to pick one or the other, I would definitely keep Mogo and kind of make that Oa 
and uh, I could do without the Guardians if I if we had to. I uh I I like the Guardians, but if I were going to do the Guardians, I would want the Guardians the way we saw them in the beginning of the John's run. I always felt that the Guardians uh were somewhat misused, especially when John's tried to turn them evil and all this stuff. I felt the Guardians were always an interesting way to have these beings who were altruistic, but they have been so focused on the million mile high view that they don't understand just the 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 realities of human interactions and the value of the individual because they were more worried about the, the, the safety of the larger group. You know, and I, I felt that they always provided an interesting perspective and it allowed uh, the Green Lantern at the time, whether it was John or Guy or Hal, a foil to go off of maybe some philosophical issues. I think there's some great storytelling that can be told if we focused a little bit on, you know, the Guardians giving a mission to a Green Lantern and they disagree and it, and it brings about this philosophical conversation about the value of the one. You know, there's always the, the, you know, to quote Star Trek, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. But what about when the needs of the one are just as important as the needs of the many? I, I think there's 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 so much storytelling that could be used with that if it's done properly. I just think it becomes an easy foil to make them the bad guys. Um, as far as Oa versus Mogo, I'm fine either way. I think if if I were in charge of DC and I, we decided to keep Oa, uh, I would put a complete moratorium on destroying Oa because that's been done to death. Uh, you know, you have writers, even like the writer we have right now, who thinks it's a smart idea. Um, but it's been done too many times. Uh, I like the idea of Mogo being used as the base because if you don't do that, there's not enough opportunity to bring Mogo in as a character. You know, he tends to only be brought in, Mogo only tends to be brought in when there's something huge going on. And I think there's a lot of really cool things that could happen with Mogo. And again, I think there's some interesting storytelling that could go on with Mogo, especially if you want to talk about climate change in a science fiction setting. Uh, you could use Mogo as a, a basis for that and it could be very, very interesting. So I think there's a lot of potential in, in both of those concepts. Uh, so let's get the next question. Power ring, play ahead. E, if you could have anyone write GL right now, instead of Thorne, who I think we're all pretty much tired off at this point, who would it be? Personally, I would probably have Williamson take over or even have Venditti come back. Uh, what writer on GL? I'll just go out on a limb here and say anybody but Thorne. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, take 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 your pick. I, there's a lot of other writers out there that I think are more deserving of this title than the person that's doing it now. Oh, for a lot of issues that we don't even need to go into, but uh, that would be my my option. Um, Bill, um, so are you are you looking at this as somebody who has not written Green Lantern right now, and would or somebody you would want to come back? Either way. Uh, either way, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I would have liked, I would like to see a fresh start with Jeff Johns a little bit. Have him come back, kind of take the reins of it again, you know. Um, I did kind of miss out on the Grant Morrison. I like Grant Morrison's other stuff, so I'm kind of, I kind of missed out on that. Um, I think of who would I mind t- taking over? I wouldn't buy. I wouldn't mind seeing what like a, a Mark Millar would do with Green Lantern. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that Honestly. could be interesting. Yeah, that'd be interesting. It would. It would be. You know, um, I love Red Sun. Yeah, so did I. And I, I thought that was, and I was like, and I mean, if you think about it, Green Lantern even has a little, you know, cameo in Red Sun. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. There's part of me that would be interested to see if I was going to go out on the limb and just say the one writer that I, I just think that would be really interesting. Or uh, Kirkman, uh, with what he did with kind of with Invisible. Yeah, good choices. Yeah, both were good choices. I I like I like his idea, Ken's idea about Williamson or or Venditti coming back. Although I'm not sure if Venditti would be interested at this point because he's kind of had two runs. If you look at the the Rebirth era and the pre Rebirth era, uh, or, or New Fifty Two at that point. But I also like the idea. I'm really loving Justice League: The Last Ride, and so I kind of like the idea of Chip Sidarsky. Uh, and then the other team up I keep thinking about is Tom King and Doc Shaner together. Uh, I know Tom King has been kind of controversial of late, uh, but I think his the book that he wrote 
that was the Dark Side War tie-in with Hal um, and 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 Hal with the the power of light was there and he visits himself as a kid in in the days in which after his father had died he's he's struggling with um you know how could god let this happen kind of thing i thought that was such a great story uh i and, and tom is tom king has said on a number of occasions to me when i've talked to him and at conventions that he thinks hal is the most fun character at dc to write so i'd love to see what he would do given an opportunity and apparently he did pitch a a Hal story, but it didn't get picked up. Um, and I'd like to see Doc Shaner do the artwork. But the other person who I've always wanted to see uh, tackle a Green Lantern run is Kurt Music. Oh, that's a good. That's a good choice too. Yeah. For and for any particular reason, um, I know that he is a, a a classic Green Lantern fan, and I've always liked. I like. Like I loved his work in Astro City. And I think he has a good, like to me, he's cut from the same cloth as Jeff Johns uh, in terms of his storytelling style. So I, I think he could bring some of that flavor back and do some world building. I think that's some of the things that he excels at. Uh, I think he would do a great job. Now, I know he's had health concerns in the past. I'm not sure. I'm not even sure what he's writing these days, uh, to be honest. But I, yeah. I'd be interested in seeing him at least come back, if even only for a short run, but to clean up uh, the current mess we're in. <laughs> anyway, Power Ring, go ahead and give us the next question. And F, if you could adapt any story in a movie slash TV series, what would you choose? Personally, I would easily do the John's run in a trilogy, but probably have the first movie be half Emerald Twilight and half Rebirth kind of like the Red Hood movie. And then the other two would be Sinestro Corps War and Blackest Night, or War of the GLs, which I love. Congrats again on your 200th episode, and thank you for talking about Green Lantern. Well, Ken, this is a great last question. I, I think if if I were producing movies for Warner Brothers, if I could be the Kevin Feige, and I was going to do something with Green Lantern, I think I would, uh, like you, I would start with a Rebirth movie that has kind of a flashback on Emerald Twilight. I wouldn't tell the whole story, because it's, it's how do you get to that point? Nobody's going to buy into it, really, without knowing too much there's too much too much world building you have to do just to make that story have any 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 dramatic punch but i would kind of start with a rebirth movie that includes a bit of a flashback on the events of emerald twilight to build it up a little bit but i'd also lay the foundation for the sinestro core war and that would be the next movie uh so i'd kind of tie those two things together uh i think blackest night would be a great movie but i'm not sure how they would get around not having the rest of the dcu fleshed out i think without knowing the backstories of you know how some of these characters died they're being brought back for the general audience it wouldn't have any dramatic punch but what i would do is i would turn blackest night into a two-part r-rated animated film instead uh in terms of another story i'd like to see turn into a live action movie the uh, three-part tales of the green lantern Corps miniseries from 1981 I would love to see that turn into a live action movie. That featured the entire Green Lantern Corps versus Krona and Necron, and I think that would be fantastic. What about you guys? Uh, Bill, why don't you go next? Um, I was thinking about the. I I, I really like the Sinestro, Sinestro War Corps. I, I I really do like. Um, so Sinestro, that's tough to say. Sinestro Core War. Uh, I think that would be the coolest to see, but um, Blackest Night. But that, that there's a lot going on there. Yeah, I'm going to go with Sinestro War Core. I think that would be a really cool movie. I think, you know, that, you know, that foil of Sinestro to uh, Hal... I think that all just works on a lot of different levels. That would be my choice. What about you, Phil? I think you could do. I think you could do a condensed version of Rebirth and explain it in a way with flashbacks and set up your Sinestro Core War. You know, so that would be your second film. You know, your your Rebirth, and then your Sinestro Core War. And then, of course, I would extend it and then do uh, a two-part Blackest Night movie or a three-hour event. That's a lot to ask for, but 
But like you said, I mean, with with so many characters uncertain of what they're doing with them these days, you you never know what you're going to get. You know, you you can't just willy nilly throw anybody in it. You know, you just you have to establish your universe before you can go big. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's my that's my pick. Well, Ken, those were some great questions. I, I hope you you liked the answers that we gave you there. Uh, it was great conversation because that's the kind of stuff we haven't done yet. So that's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, we've got one more message, so why don't we go ahead and listen to that one. Power Ring, uh, go ahead and play the next message. Our last message comes from Corey. Transmission commencing in 3, 2, 1. Congratulations on your 200th episode. Thank you for being great ambassadors for the Green Lantern franchise. I always look forward to new episodes dropping, as you become my co-pilots and join me on my work commute or make my yard work more enjoyable. Between you and other listener feedback, Hearing different viewpoints has made me a smarter GL fan. Looking forward to the next 200 episodes. Thanks, Corey. Uh, as always, man, it's just it's fun getting these the, these uh, the feedback from for a congratulatory 200 episode. I mean, it's I mean it's it's a milestone, you know, and and especially in this this kind of podcasting market, you know, it's we've been around for a long time, and um, it's it's nice to know that you find enjoyment in it, you know doing what you're doing for your commute you know luckily my commute's only 10 minutes so <laughs> it doesn't give me much time for anything but um uh, I'm, I'm glad you like it i'm glad you enjoy it and, and and thanks for writing in yeah Corey, i appreciate you you, you uh writing us again and, and giving us some feedback and uh, you know it, your comments about helping you through your work day or doing yard work and stuff that really uh, that resonates for me because that's kind of what what this was all about is trying to provide some content for people and, and enriching their fan experience uh, with, with the Green Lantern franchise and trying to be good ambassadors, as we've said before. And so I, I really appreciate you telling us that. And I, I hope that we don't let people down. And, and I'm looking forward to doing this uh, for a while, uh, hopefully, uh, as long as my health keeps along and lets me continue. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. So uh, Power Ring, why don't you tell how everybody how they can be a part of the show? You can become a part of the show by leaving a message up to one minute long on our voicemail line. Call us at 406 Pot of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can also email us at podcast at blogofoa.com. We'd love to hear from you. What up, dweebs? This is Guy Gardner. You're listening to the podcast of Oa. All right, gentlemen, we've been going on for a couple of hours now. And, and Bill, I know when we first started, that was one of our things was to keep it down to an hour because it was a good a good size. But this being 200 episodes, uh, two hours. <laughs> uh, so before yeah, we, we double, double it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, as we're getting ready to, to sign off, I, I want to give you both a chance to say whatever you'd like to say. Uh, to the listeners and to each other and so on before we, we call it an episode. So, um, Phil, why don't we start with you? Yeah. Um, you know, I look forward to every week when, when my, or every other couple weeks or whatever we do it when Myron and I record, but this one was special in a way that, you know, I got to sit and talk to Bill too. You know, I, I don't get an, an opportunity to talk to Bill that often. And, you know, and besides what Myron says, hey, I always ask how you're doing and stuff. And, you know, he always tells me. But, like, to be able to sit here and have a discussion and talk about stuff uh, and have him on here, it to me that meant a lot. Because, you know, I mean, it started with you two, you know, and it's still going. And I still, it's it's nice to be able to talk to Bill, you know, since it's been so long, you know. And and I got great pleasure out of doing that tonight. Well, I'm... Well, thank you, Phil. I mean, I, I'm I'm so glad that you were able to, you know, take the torch and you know really go with it and um, continue on for another hundred episodes. I I think this is um, you know, Myron. I don't I don't think I'd ever imagine this. I mean, you know, in between your blog and this, I mean, uh, you've become come quite the ambassador and ambassadors and both <laughs> you become quite the bastard. Wow. It is getting late. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you become quite the ambassador um, along with Phil. And just, uh, I think it's a testimony seeing all these um, listener feedbacks um, of how much this means to uh, so many people. I think that's a great accomplishment. 
Yeah, I, uh, you know, I just want to want to end with uh, thanking the both of you for being a part of this because, uh, you know, as I said before, I'm kind of an introverted person in, in, in reality, and. I, throughout my entire life, I've always kind of felt alone with things, and I didn't think there was anybody else out there that that shared the things and interests that that I did, and um, would allow me to have a voice in anything um, without getting too in, into my my previous life. And so, I can't think of two people who I would want to share this episode with more than the two of you. And I thank you both for all of the work you've done to bring help bring this forth and keep it going for 200 episodes and for 10 years. Uh, I could not have done it on my own, and I can't think of two people that could have made this any better. Um, Bill, from your, your original vision of the show and the creativity to, to, to add some life to it in the beginning and to compensate for my own shortcomings as, as a, a public speaker and so on, and, and Phil, for your, your love of the mythology and... Uh, playing a good foil to me and not being afraid to speak your opinion, opinion even if it's different from my own. Uh, I, I value that and both of you guys very, very highly. And to the listeners, uh, I, again, I never thought anybody would even listen to this show. So for people to make this a part of their fan experience, uh, I am humbled by that. And I hope that we don't ever let you down. And I hope you'll stick with us for the long run. And I know right now we seem kind of negative about the Green Lantern franchise, but I am confident that it will get better. Uh, at least I certainly hope so. <laughs> but um, I'm confident that it will get better. There are better days in front of us. For those of you that like the current run, uh, I, I, you know, we, we talk down about it and talk badly about it. And we hope that it doesn't spoil your experience. Um, but we hope that you understand our frustration with it. So um, with all of that said, uh, again, gentlemen, thank you both for joining me this evening. No, well, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot, Myron. So, as always, everybody, until next time, treat each other well, keep your power rings charged, and make every day your brightest day. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogavoa.com. You can also find the blog of OA and the podcast of OA on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The blog of OA and the podcast of OA are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties. Hey everybody, it's Myron. Thanks again for sticking around with Phil and Bill and I as we kind of reflected back over the last 10 years and 200 episodes of the podcast of OA. Uh, throughout this episode, there were a number of occasions where we mentioned the now infamous uh, interview with Guy Gardner. And I thought it'd be kind of a neat little bonus Easter egg if I included the interview at the end of the show. So if you kind of went through the entire two hours and listened through the theme music, you'd find a little goodie. So I hope you enjoyed this clip. Uh, I do have to apologize that the audio isn't quite up to snuff with what we do these days. Uh, this was from Podcast of OA number, uh, episode number 17. And at that time, Bill and I really didn't have that good of equipment and we didn't have the greatest of editing software. So the, the audio levels are a little off. I've tried to clean it up a little bit to uh, maybe not necessarily the best quality possible, but is a little bit better than what it was originally. So without further ado, uh, thanks again for listening to the show and being a part of our community and enjoy this little extra bonus goodie. Well, Bill, uh, I do have some bad news for this episode. Uh, we were going to have Isamat Cole on for another interview for our Green Lantern 101 segment, but he had to cancel due to disturbance in his sector. So we apologize to all our listeners. We are going to have to postpone the interview to just... Wait a minute. We've got an incoming call from Sector 2814. Um, hello? Yo, it's Guy Gardner. Oh, uh, 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 Mr. Gardner, this is, I'm Myron Rumsey. I'm the creator of the blog of Oh, What a surprise. I know who you are, Myron, and just call me Guy. Hey, Guy, I'm Bill Giancoli, co-host of That's podcast. That's Mr. Gardner to you, Billy. Um, well, what do we owe the honor to, Guy? Yeah, Isamot mentioned he was interviewing with you guys today. When I heard he bailed, I thought I would fill in, see what these so-called spotlights are all about. That's mighty nice of you, Guy. What are you, an idiot? I said it's Mr. Gardner to you. I, I... I thought we were joking. Oh, right, because you're the funny one, right? The jokester, Mr. Ha-Ha, Mr. Big Time Funny Man. 
Well, I'd like to think we're actually both pretty funny. Yeah, I'll get to you in a second there, Geek Boy. Geek Boy? Listen up, Billy Boy. When you're sitting on your soft butt talking smack about me, I'm out in the middle of some godforsaken galaxy defending lives from threats your puny mind couldn't understand. I think I'm free to express an opinion if I would like. So am I, and my opinion is that you're a big bag of shit that has his head so far up his own ass he can see his lunch. Whoa, 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 time out, time out. Guy, we have kids that listen to this show, and we can't have you talking like that during an interview. Where, where's all this hostility coming from? Probably from years of frustration dealing with scumbags from all sectors in the universe. Could also be hereditary, too, you know? My old man wasn't the happiest camper on the planet. So you had a rough childhood? Yeah, I guess you could say that. Baltimore is not for the faint-hearted. You gotta watch your back in most neighborhoods. I had to watch mine on the street and in my home. Daddy was quick with the fist, if you know what I'm saying. He hit you? That's what I was not so subtly implying, Sherlock. Wow. I, I, you know, I'm really sorry to hear that. I, I'm impressed you were able to succeed coming from that kind of an environment. Yeah, well, we all have weird things that motivate us. Not wanting to be a miserable, abusive father was mine. I found the best way to do that was to avoid home as much as possible. So, where did you go? I would hang out around the neighborhood. This sometimes led to trouble. How so, Mr. Gardner? Run-ins with the law. You know, stupid stuff. Kid rebelling type of stuff. Luckily, my bro was a cop. This not only helped me skirt a few misdemeanors, but it led to my brother setting me straight. So what'd your brother do to do that? He helped me get into a college. See the value of an honest living. My brother showed me that people can do good in this life. What did you study in college? Education and psychology. Hey, me too. Oh, it's a real thrill to have something in common with you, Billy. So, Guy, I thought I read somewhere that you played college football. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I was really something, too. Probably could have gone pro if it weren't for a bad injury. You and Al Bundy. Billy, we should play football sometime. No equipment, just my foot and your tiny little ball. <laughs> yeah, of all guy. Um, what, what did you do when you, you weren't a Green Lantern? I mean, what did you do for a living? I worked as a caseworker for prisoners. Man, that was just too close to home. Talking to those guys showed me where I could have ended up, you know? So I left that and taught special education before I got this whole galactic cop gig. Just how did you get the ring? Well, dipshit, it might be a little too complicated for you to follow, but it goes like this. Apparently, Abin Sir's ring found that I was equally deserving as Hal, but Abin Sir's jalopy crashed in Hal's backyard, so finders keepers. Now, didn't I read somewhere that Booster Gold kind of had something to do with all that? Yeah, there was some scuttlebutt about me in another reality where I was actually closer to the crash site, but Booster Gold convinced me to visit my dying father and make amends, so Hal was closer. Apparently, Hal had a vision that if I did get the ring first, I would have died a few months later, and he would end up with it anyways. Either way, I got a ring now, and I know how to use it. The best record of how I got the ring is in Green Lantern, Volume 2, Number 59. So the story goes, a boy from an abusive household on the mean streets of Baltimore works his way up to become a superhero and live the dream? Living the dream, Psh, right. This ring may give me awesome power, but it ain't no picnic. I'll bet you've seen a lot, huh? You could say that. Whether it was a massive earthquake that led to me getting hit by a school bus... A or bus?! Did I stutter, Billy? Yeah, a school bus. When I recovered and put the ring back on, I went to charge it and my battery exploded in my face. Ouch. Worse than ouch. Pain is temporary. This experience was slow torture. See, I was transported to the Phantom Zone. The Phantom Zone? Isn't that the mirror thing in the Superman movie that General Zod was imprisoned in? That's the one. Stuck in the hellhole with Zod himself where him and his Kryptonian thugs were torturing me non-stop. But that wasn't the worst of it. How could it have gotten worse? All this time, I'm getting the crap kicked out of me in this Phantom Zone. My psychic girlfriend at the time, Carrie Limbo, starts dating Hal Jordan. That's low, bro. Oh, we're bros now, are we, Billy? But for once in your stinking life, you're right. It sucked. But to both their credit, they thought I was gone. Well, how did you get out of the Phantom Zone? I was able to reach out to Carrie telepathically. But after I was freed, I was left comatose and brain damaged. 
Well, you bet your ass, wow. You must know a little bit about being brain damaged, eh, Billy? So, what happened next? Well, that's where John Stewart came in, and the Third Earth Lantern is born. Eventually, I'm revived during the Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now, some of the things that I've read said that you were, well, how do I put this delicately, you were different after the explosion. Define different, moron. I mean, Myron. Um, you were a, maybe a bit more arrogant or violent or, you know, maybe you just were a little more outspoken. Huh. If you ever have a school bus hit you, a cosmic battery blow up in your face, transporting you to some kind of a limbo-like prison where you're tortured daily, all the while your girlfriend is getting romantic with a fellow Green Lantern and a so-called friend, well, yeah, you may develop a few undesirable personality traits yourself. True, true, true. Yeah. yeah. What is it, Salak? Lantern Gardener, I need you to escort a Sligian transport through Outer Limits. Ah, be there soon enough. Time is short, Lantern Gardener. I heard you. Don't get your alien panties in a bunch. Listen, Myron, I gotta go. Hey, that's absolutely no problem, guy. It's been an honor. Hopefully, can we do this again and, and follow up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, guy. Kiss my fat Billy. I think he's warming up to me.